Well, if we've got any camel whisperers out there, you might be thinking about this eclipse. I guess if somebody climbed on top of me and expected me to, you know, walk across walk part across of the Sahara, the I'd be a little cranky too. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Probably. Most likely. Yeah. So I guess it only takes 5,000 years for the entire planet to get in the shadow of a total eclipse. That's fascinating. I didn't know that. Yeah. Andrew Corkill. Hi, Scott and team. Andrew's out there in Southern California. Mm. I wonder if he's got clear skies. I know we're going to clear skies in, in, uh, there in Arizona. 400 years from now. <laughs> yeah. Do you think you and I will be around to see it? <laughs> well, some of us will. Some part of us will. <laughs> yeah. Our atoms will be. Our atoms will. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Jim Mosley's tuning in here. <clears throat> Yeah, so the visualization that you're seeing here is provided by NASA, and it is all that blue going across our planet is a shade from an eclipse. So you'll see it run. Here we go. All the eclipses over 5,000 years. Looks like somebody's scribbling with kind of a glow in the dark felt tip pen or something. <laughs> that is a kid on too much caffeine with an etch a sketch. I was thinking of the etch a sketch <laughs> <right>. myself. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I used to color my coloring book. <laughs> Today it's going to be green. Yeah. Mm hmm. Tarek says, so is this live so early maybe? Well, it's live, Tarek, um, but it's right now it's six o'clock and it's time for us to go on. Here we go. On Eclipse Day, Citizen Kate will deploy 35 teams of community participants with telescopes, cameras, mounts, all the equipment that you need to observe the eclipse, all the way from Texas to Maine, so that we can make observations of the eclipse of totality in polarized visible light and get about an hour-long movie of totality. When you look at a total solar eclipse, you look at that bright corona, you're not actually seeing light that's coming from the corona itself. You're looking at light that came from the surface of the sun. It went out and then it bounced around and moved through the corona to our eyes. When we're looking with our cameras in Kate 2024, what we're looking at is exactly how that light was bouncing around in the corona before it came to us. And the way that it was doing that tells us about what's happening in the corona. There are a lot of scientific experiments that have questions so big that you can't do it just with scientists. You need to engage a huge team of people. And the best way to do that is to engage with the public. For Kate 2024, we need to have 35 teams of people all along the eclipse path. We just can't do that with professionals. We need to engage with community participants. That's the only way we can get the breadth of data that we need for this experiment. Anybody can join Kate 2024. People without a scientific background, people who have never used a telescope, in fact, those are exactly the kinds of people we want on the team because we want to train the next generation of scientists. We want to instill that love of science in people that may otherwise not have an experience like this.
Well, hello everyone. This is Scott Roberts with Explore Scientific, and I'm about to bring on my co-host, David Levy. Here we go. And um, our, uh, our episode uh, this time is inspired by uh, David Levy's thing, uh, theme of uh, uh, changing perceptions. And that is something that I, I think is near and dear to all of us that do astronomy outreach, uh, because it's something that, uh, uh, you know, you certainly witness when someone uh, maybe for the very first time is looking in the IPC or telescope and they're seeing, in the case of uh, David Levy's telescopes, probably a comet or some beautiful deep sky object. And uh, uh, for me, it would probably be on a street corner uh, somewhere showing Saturn or the moon uh, that kind of thing, but you do see, you actually do see that they they visibly are are, are changed, uh, not <laughs> in a good way. Um, uh, you know, what is your take on that, David? I think it's uh, I think it's the reason that I am into astronomy, into the night sky. Actually, I have to admit that I'm not really into astronomy. There's a difference between the science of astronomy and the beauty, magic, and majesty of the night sky. That latter part is what I'm in for, what I'm in for it yeah. with. I, 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 would, I would agree with that too. I, I love hearing about the discoveries. I love the adventure of it, the exploration of it, uh, the personal exploration side of it, I, I really uh, enjoy. But there's nothing that really gets me excited like seeing someone else uh, being affected by all this, you know, and I think that, uh, um, you know, the the big thing that happens is, is that, uh, well, several things could happen. One is, is that someone feels uh, incredibly small, you know, uh, once they start realizing the sizes of things, you know, um, after spending all day long thinking that they were the, you know, uh, uh, you know, being focused on themselves, you know, uh, uh, and then coming out at night and looking out at another planet or, um, you know, the moon or something uh, that gives them a sense of scale, you know, um, that is something that uh, humbles them. And, uh, you know, it is, you know, astronomy is a very humbling ex experience, I think. So... We have um, we have a great lineup tonight, uh, David, um, and we're going to start off this program, of course, with you. And uh, you know, if you have any um, additional words you'd like to add about uh, uh, changing perceptions, that would be wonderful. Well, thank you, thank you, Scotty, and uh, welcome to the 146. And uh, in honor of that, I am donning today my McGill sweater. And I'm doing that because there's a little story about McGill I wouldn't mind sharing with you. I, I flunked out of McGill my first try there. I just flunked out. I got four Fs and one D minus. And uh, so I took this first year again. And I flunked out a second time. I had four D minus, three D minuses. And, uh, and, and a three Fs and a D minus <laughs> or something like that. Um, hard grade to get. Uh, when I flunked out the first time, I my dad was really angry with me. He was angry the second time too. But the first time he was really angry because in addition to flunking out of McGill, I had also gotten very nearly expelled from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And dad took me for a walk after in the middle of that. And he was yelling at me and saying that, you know, if you had kept your mouth shut, all you had to do is keep your mouth shut. This wouldn't have happened. And we wouldn't have this dreadful embarrassment for you. And I just kind of sat, stood there and walked and took it because he was right. About five days later was my birthday. And dad said, he motioned, he said, another walk. We started walking, and I said, okay, Dad, well, let me have it. And he said, David, I was wrong. 
And I said, what? And he said, David, first of all, I'm not going to yell at you on your birthday. And secondly, I was wrong. You were provoked. There were some people there who really yelled and screamed at you, and you were provoked, and you were defending yourself. And I'm proud of you for that. And I said, I said to dad, with all due respect, I think you were more right the first time. Because I did have a lot of, uh, I did have, I do have a big mouth and I do talk without thinking and I make a lot of mistakes. I have a lot of growing up to do. Dad looked at me and he said, I think you've just done some. And that was really a very special experience on that particular birthday. For my poem today, it is an obvious choice. It is the one that uh, is the theme of our star party tonight and one that I wrote in my guide to the night sky, which is apparently still in print. I don't know how that happened, but it was published by Cambridge University Press ages ago and it's still around. And this is the quotation. Our fondness for the stars has touched our souls. And this is why I'm in astronomy. We all share the feeling of discovery, whether the object we have found is new to all or new only to us. The thrill penetrates our dream, our being, as we try to describe through drawings, photographs, or words, how we have been changed by the universe sharing a secret with us. Thank you and back to you, Scott. Okay, wonderful, wonderful, okay. Um, our, uh, you know, I love, I love hearing the poetry, David, and, uh, I know that, uh, uh, you and I talked about this a long time ago, but, uh, uh, you know, we talked about, uh, the idea that you might do a book on, uh, astronomical poetry. It's, uh, part of the reason why you got your PhD and, uh, um, are you uh, are you expecting that book to come out anytime soon? Uh, not anytime soon. I'm still writing it, uh -huh. and uh, it's it's a big project. But the person who really deserves the credit for this is my friend Dave Rossiter's wife, ah. Pam Rossiter. She was the one who suggested it. Do you remember after I lost Wendy, I was having a a very severe loss of weight, and uh, uh, I put on a lot of that back, but not all yeah. of it. And everybody was advising me, including you, that I had to eat more and I had to drink more and I had to do this more and that more. Yeah. And uh, even Dave was doing that. And then yeah. Pam was one day and she said, I have so much I suggestion too. And I said, okay, let's hear it. I think you should write a book. And I said, you mean you're not going to tell me to eat? Of course I'm going to tell you to eat and drink. But I want, my suggestion is, I want you to be writing another book. I don't care what it's about. And I said, Pam, I got to tell you, I'm getting a little bit old for that. As a matter of fact, I could share with all of you right now that I'm one of the few people at the uh, Global Star Party that was alive the very first years of my life Albert Einstein, who we're going to have later on today, was also still alive, just for the first two, three, four years of my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really something. Sure. Someone, something that I, as I get older, and I'm thinking, what a privilege that I was alive at the same time that that man was still living. Yeah. That was really, really something. And... Uh, uh, did I answer your question, Scott? Or... Yes, you did. Yes, you did. We talked about the uh, uh, the idea of the new book, and um, and you gave us the uh, backstory to that. So that's great. It's going to be a while before it comes out. In fact, I have one before that that is about to be accepted by University of Arizona Press, and then it's the one after that. I would say about three, four years. Three or four but years. It's okay. A lot of time to work on it and write it. Excellent, excellent. Well, up next is gonna be David Eicher, who uh, uh, has written a book about galaxies. Um, and um, 
anytime he's talking about uh, a deep sky object, he knows an incredible amount of uh, backstory to it as well. And uh, um, I, I love to hear him describe uh, celestial objects. And uh, if you guys are not familiar with David Eicher, if you're if this is the first time you're watching Global Star Party, David is the editor in chief of Astronomy Magazine. If you're not yet a subscriber to either the print or digital version or both, uh, uh, you should probably jump on that. Um, he is also uh, one of the organizers of the Starmus event, which David Levy will be going to. I'm involved with uh, uh, the Star Party, and uh, David Eicher will talk about that a little bit later. Um, but uh, he is going to talk about this really amazing galaxy, NGC 5907. And if you go to the link that's in this, uh, um, you know, it goes along with this post, you can see a link to uh, the bio for David Eicher. But there's also a link to NGC 5907 directly back to the Astronomy Magazine website, which I thought was very appropriate. So, um, Thank you for coming on, uh, David. Uh, you've been busy, and um, we're really privileged to have you back. Thank you, Scott. It's always great to be here. And uh, having finished talking about the Civil War now, I'll get back to pure astronomy and, and objects. And one of these uh, here tonight, uh, the one I'm going to talk about tonight, is indeed a galaxy, which, you know, there are lots of them out there, and they are favorites. So I will... What do I need to, need to do? I need to share my screen. I need to share the right thing. And I need to start a slide show. And I will hope that you can see what I am seeing, which is not the galaxy I'm going to talk about. This is Centaurus A, which may, long after we're gone, end up uh, how, how the <clears throat> combination of the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way appears, something like this, perhaps. But that's not the point tonight. The point tonight is to talk about NGC 5907 in Draco, which is one of the greatest edge-on galaxies in the sky. Sometimes it's called the splinter or the knife edge. It lies in the sky a short distance from what commonly has been agreed upon as M102, NGC 5866, in what were, of course, a couple of those latter-day extensions of the Messier catalog. There was some controversy over M102 being a simple error originally in a repetition of M101, but it was adopted by most folks uh, a generation or two ago now as NGC 5866. Well, anyway, near this <clears throat> field of interesting galaxies in Draco, is the 11th magnitude, very much edge-on galaxy NGC 5907. It's about uh, nearly 13 arc minutes across and very thin. It's a member of the M102 group. It's about 50, a uh, little more than 50 million light years away. So, you know, comparable, if you will, to the distance uh, to the Virgo cluster, but in a different direction. Uh, it's a prototypical warped spiral. In 2006, a team of astronomers detected an extensive tidal stream surrounding the galaxy uh, and the hints of a warping of, of the disk. And of course, tidal forces on very large scales across portions of neighborhoods of or entire galaxies <clears throat> work on very large scales. Um, very effectively, and we can see the interaction of many galaxies and clusters with tidal forces acting on them and pulling things out of galaxies. This galaxy has a very strangely low metallicity and a very small number of giant stars. It's almost entirely composed of dwarfs. So star formation has not occurred in this galaxy for a very long time on anything but a very small scale. There's a single supernova that was recorded in, in this galaxy, 5907 in 1940. It was a 14th magnitude object. And here we go back to Ron Stoyan's excellent and fairly compact interstellarum atlas and see the field of NGC 5907 in the uh, center here. And you can see M102 down near 
uh, to its lower right. And uh, we're kind of on an edge of Draco here, as you can see by the constellation border, a fairly rich area of galaxies. This is a, a very nice amateur, high-end amateur image of NGC 5907. Um, here and you can see this truly is very much edge on. We're seeing the dust lane, which you know, of course, runs across the edge of the galaxy's bright disk, almost oriented exactly edge on. It's off a, a fraction of a degree from being exactly edge on. This is an infrared image of NGC 5907. The dust in the galaxy is in red. This is a Spitzer image just to kind of show a very dramatically different look at the distribution of dust in this galaxy. And that's it. And uh, all I have is to present another, and we only have, I think, about 400 objects now to go, Scott. So we're making oh. progress <laughs> here. Um, we're starting to run out. We're starting to run out. Uh, I have yeah. to think of something else to do in another seven or eight years. Um, but we do have, as you may know, an eclipse. Not only is there, I'm not talking about the eclipse on March 25th, which you may know of also. There's a nice penumbral lunar eclipse coming up on the late evening of March 25th and early morning of March 26th, hmm. which you may know about. It'll be very visible from the Americas and from the Pacific Basin. But we also have a big total solar eclipse coming um, and we're all be in Dallas uh, with Celestron and with the uh, Weather Channel and possibly some other television folks who are joining on. We'll be at Love Field in Dallas and we'll have uh, nearly four minutes there of totality. And I hope that we'll have clear weather everywhere and that you'll have a great eclipse experience if you're going, because that'll be here before we know it. Our April issue is devoted to the eclipse a special issue packed with everything you can imagine. Steve O'Meara, Michael Zeiler, Michael Bakich, and others, Rich Talcott writing about everything you need to know about the eclipse. So there you go. Also, as Scott mentioned, uh, Starmus is coming up only about a month after the eclipse and a little change in Bratislava. Uh, we have an astrophoto school that we're going to run there, imaging uh, becoming very explosively popular, of course, with all these smart telescopes that now exist. One of them is behind Scott's right shoulder there in his image, the great unistellar scope. And uh, so imaging is really becoming much easier to do and facilitated by filters and other uh, high-tech data such that imaging can be done really in, in more light polluted sites with great results now. So there's really a revolution in imaging going on We'll have an astrophoto school going on at Starmus. Many, many, it's already, I think the count is already up over 50 of speakers who are Nobel Prize winners, who are astronauts, who are rock musicians, who are involved in the Starmus board uh, with me and with others. And so we are very excited and hope that you'll be able to fly in, which you can do very easily to Vienna, Austria. And that's practically right on top of Bratislava. So uh, that's in mid-May. It's actually very easy to get there and, and to partake in this. We expect that we'll have six or 8,000 people at least there in person, and we'll have lots of stuff to write about and some rock and roll with Brian Moe and Rick Wakeman and others, as well as um, Jean-Michel Jarre, the, the fellow who has produced the largest outdoor concerts ever in world history. Um, the largest one in the Guinness book being in Moscow a number of years ago. But there are very special plans with Jean-Michel and Brian to do some things that will be unheard of, that have never been done before to open Starmus. So we're excited about that. We will have a star party with Scott being involved with telescopes there um, to observe with a large crowd this time there at a 12th century castle of all things this time. So really incredible and exotic locations and many, many, many talks, of course, from scientists of all areas, not only astronomy um, and uh, lots of exciting surprises to come there too. And I know that Scott and David, you will also be there. Um, so we're looking forward to a lot of fun and we're hoping that we don't have to just report on all the cool stuff that's happened 
that you'll have to miss. We hope that we'll see some of you guys there as well in person because that's right. really there's nothing else like it. That's right. Yes. And so you're that's all invited. where you're all invited. And it's actually very cheap to get into the festival um, because the Slovakian government and other folks are helping to sponsor. You can see Asset, that's a major company in Slovakia is sponsoring much of the festival. So it's really cheap actually to buy the ticket to the festival. Most of the cost is to, is to get over there, uh, to fly over there, you know, it's flying to Europe um, and then of course a hotel. So so uh, you don't wanna miss out on this. We will not have another Starmus for a couple of years after this one. So uh, there, there really is an incredible um, series of events waiting there for us. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, Thank you. Uh, yep, and I can I can say with uh, great enthusiasm that it is hands down one of the most amazing uh, astronomical and intellectual events that you could ever attend. So um, it's quite something, and to have so many Nobel Prize winners, so many astronauts stretching from a you know Charlie Duke will be there, and others you know from the Apollo days right on up to the modern uh, astronaut, you know, Chris Hadfield and many others will be there as well, talking and performing and to get close and talk to all these people and hear their thoughts about the world, about science, about where things are going with the world. The theme this this time will be Earth and how we're taking care of it, or maybe not so much. So yeah, it, it is really, there's nothing else really like it at all as a science festival goes. Right. You're absolutely right about that. Well, thank you so much, David. Thank you. David, I thought that was particularly good and interesting and insightful. Thank you. Thank you, David. And and thank you, Scott, as always. And uh, delighted to be. I was away the, a couple of crazy things going on in trips, but I'm glad to be back now. And we'll have smooth sailing right up until the eclipse here. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, Mike Wiesner's uh, offering to pilot, pilot the... Uh, Explore Scientific Supersonic Airliner. Uh, yeah. To get the star mess, so. You can land it right in Vienna and in That's a half right. hour you're in Bratislava. It's very That's easy. Right. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, David. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Take care. Okay. Well, uh, Dr. Levy, we have our friend Chuck Allen uh, from the Astronomical League up next. Um, and I love his presentations. He always gives, uh, you know, the biggest, the most furthest away, the most amazing uh, types of uh, talks. And he really stretches your mind, uh, you know, as far as he can, he can take it um, uh, in his explanations about the universe. I got to know, I got to know Chuck, I say, uh, at, very well at last year's Baton Rouge Astronomical League presentations. Oh, right. Is that really the first time for you to meet with Chuck? I think I met him before, but 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 that, that was the time I really got to know the man. His yeah. passion, yeah. his love for the night yeah. sky. And I'm really, really yeah. so glad that we're sharing the stage today. Oh, yeah. That's great. Well, um, let's bring him on. Now, I also like his setup right where he's at right now. He's got Clyde Tomba behind him, okay, a portrait of Clyde. Uh, actually, there's a few things that's kind of behind him that uh, are very interesting. Sometimes he points them out when he's, when he's giving his talk. But uh, uh, Chuck, thanks for coming on to uh, Global Star Party this time. What is the topic? What is your... Uh, uh, the title of your presentation. Well, we're going to be talking about how people who did not have the tools that we have today began to try to figure out how far away things were, how far away the moon and sun and stars were. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I'll let you take it away. Uh, I do want to say that uh, we are very pleased to have the Astronomical League on every global star party it's it's wonderful um uh, even when terry mann was up in alaska you know doing her aurora uh work up there she made sure she dashed into her hotel room and and uh 
made, made sure that she made connections so that she could come on to the show. That was our last program. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing some of her auroral uh, imagery. It's beautiful stuff that she does. Um, but uh, I think our whole audience really loves hearing your presentations, Chuck. So well, thanks for, thanks no pressure. Don't put me under any pressure. There, <laughs> <laughs> and he is hands down the best lecturer in astronomy and in the, the world today. So Right, right. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes. Um, you know what? I, I think at times <laughs> you do achieve that. So it's, uh -huh. it, you're really fantastic. Well, we'll, thank we'll you. See. Thank you, thank Scott. You. And thanks for all you do for the league, too. Thank you. By the way. And I met uh, David, I think, the first time at Ritzland, maybe back in the late 90s. Uh, I think the first time. At least we were in a car together. And uh, I don't think we had a lot of time to interact at that particular time. But uh, it was at uh, Hidden Hollow. Anyway, um, imagine that you're uh, an ancient. Uh, and you're looking up at the night sky. And... Let's get this going here. And you're constantly wondering as you look up about the moon, the sun, the stars. You have no telescope. You have no way in the world of really measuring distances to the things you see. And you're really curious about just exactly how far away these things are. Uh, humans have been around 300,000 years until the Greeks, uh, about two or 300 years uh, BC began to figure out some things using their heads. They became very scientific, very mathematically inclined, and they were wanderers. They wondered about the distance to the moon and the sun and the stars. And the first attempts were really uh, what you would call relative ones. That is, they knew they couldn't measure the distance to anything, but they thought they could figure out how far, for example, the sun was in relation to the distance to the moon. How many times further was it? Or perhaps how many times further stars were than the sun, for example. And the first to really uh, undertake uh, a project along these lines was Aristarchus in about 250 BC. And he made the first attempt to determine how much further the sun was than the moon. Again, not the actual distance, just how much further it was. And he came up with a brilliant idea. He said, if I could just measure the angle between the sun and the moon when it's exactly at first quarter, which does not occur, as you can see, when the moon's at a 90 degree position from the sun, uh, if he could make that determination, he could use trigonometry, which the Greeks had basically invented in order to determine how much further the sun was. He wouldn't know the distance to the moon, but he would know how many times further than the moon the sun was. That's what he was looking for. He did a calculation and came up with 19. Now he was way off. He, his calculation was uh, beset by problems. One was determining the exact moment of first quarter on a very rough surfaced moon. And the second is measuring this angle, which he measured to be a little too small compared to what it actually is, because the moon's actually, or the sun rather, is actually 400 times further than the moon. But it's a brilliant idea, and it might have worked. Uh, Hipparchus came along in 150 BC, and uh, armed with information about the size of the Earth, which Eratosthenes had measured, he decided that he had a way of measuring the distance to the moon, the actual distance. And he did it using eclipse observations and that data from Eratosthenes. And the way he did it was this. He knew that the eclipses, uh, total or eclipses of the uh, moon were uh, evidencing Earth's shadow being about two and a half times wider than the full moon itself. He also knew, the Greeks knew, that any sphere, no matter how big, at roughly the Earth's distance from the sun would cast a shadow 108 times its diameter. The actual appearance of that would be the little diagram you see at the bottom there, the long, thin shadow, 108 times the diameter. But he now knew the diameter of the Earth because of Eratosthenes' work. And so what he did, and you don't have to get all messed up in this diagram, but just understand that what he figured out was that when the moon eclipsed the sun, its shadow only barely reached the Earth on a small point, as it will on April 8th. He also knew that the shadow the Earth was two and a half times bigger than the diameter of the moon during total eclipses. And from this, and just using a law of congruent triangles, 
he figured that the moon's distance was one part in 3.5 of that length of the Earth's shadow. And he came up with 246,857 miles. And that is right exactly in the true range of the moon, which ranges between 225,000 and 251,000 miles. Now, this is a, a man who was working without telescopes, without instruments, wow. really, of any kind. Uh, really an incredible job. But the sun remained an enigma. How far was the sun? Nothing casts a shadow on the sun. So it would be another 1,800 years before people finally figured out how to measure the distance to the sun. Meanwhile, in roughly 1618, Johannes Kepler came up with an amazing uh, study of planetary motions. And he determined that there was a relationship between the orbital periods of planets and the semi-major axis of their elliptical orbits. And from this, he was able to calculate in relation again to the Earth's distance from the sun, how far the other planets were. Once again, the distance between the Earth and the sun was unknown. But he was able to determine that Mercury was about 38.9% as far away, that Venus was 72% as far away as the Earth was, that Mars was one and a half times further than Earth was, that Jupiter was a little more than five times further than Earth was, and Saturn nine and a half. And over on the right, you see the actual distances compared to the Earth-Sun distance. He knocked it out of the park. It was an incredible study. And it was followed up a few years later by Johann Bode and Johann Titius, who came up with a mathematical construct that matched uh, what Kepler had found exactly. He simply took a series of numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. He multiplied them all by 0.3 and divided them all by 0.4. And he got the same ratios that Kepler did for the distances to the planets relative to the Earth's distance. But once again, nobody knew how far that Earth-Sun distance was. Once we figured out how far the sun was, we would therefore know how far all the planets were from the sun as well. But that had to wait for that ultimate determination of how far the sun was. And that's still a big problem until a man by the name of James Gregory comes along. Now, this was a brilliant mathematician. He made advances in trigonometry. He was the first person to prove the, the fundamental theorem of calculus. He developed the Gregorian telescope. And unfortunately, while showing his students Jupiter and its moons one night, he suffered a massive stroke at the age of 36 and died just a few days later, a terrible loss at a very young age. But during his life, he came up with a plan. It was a plan for determining the exact distance to the sun. And he also had a plan for determining a distance to a star. He started with that first one. How far was Sirius in relation to the distance between the Earth and the Sun, which again was still unknown? He figured that if he observed Jupiter and Sirius at roughly the same time when they're in the same place in the sky on the same night, um, he could make a comparison. He knew that Jupiter was five times further than the Earth from the Sun because of Kepler's work so that the light from the sun reflecting off of Jupiter had to travel about nine times the distance between the Earth and the sun to reach uh, the Earth. So he compared the brightness that he received from Jupiter with that of Sirius, and he came up uh, with a number of 83,190 times the Earth-Sun distance, whatever that was. Now that would be equivalent to 1.32 light years, or what we would call 1.32 light years today. But he assumed that Sirius was no more luminous than the sun, that they were stars of equal brightness. That's not true. Sirius is about 25 times more luminous than the sun. And had he known that, he would have multiplied his result by the square root of that number and obtained a distance of 6.6 .6 light years, which is really not bad, considering that Sirius is actually just 8.6 .6 light years away. So this man came up with a way to measure the distance to a star before the distance to the sun is even known, uh, at least in relation to the Earth-Sun distance. But then he came up with a magical plan. He came up with a plan he knew he could not execute in his lifetime. And that was a plan to determine the distance to the sun using the transit of Venus, two of them that were going to occur in 1761 and 1769. 
Now, he wasn't going to live to see that. He would be 123 years old before the first one. But he wrote down his plan, and it involved measuring from two locations on the Earth. Now, this is a simplistic view of what he did. Imagine you set up two observing stations on the Earth, a known distance apart, hypothetically 3,600 miles in this case. And you both observe the transit of Venus across the face of the sun. Naturally, they would observe Venus's image at two different locations on the sun's disk. Well, suppose you measured the angle as seen from the Earth of those two points that were observed from those two observing locations. You would know, since Venus was known to be only 72% the Earth's distance from the sun, that if you observe those two points from Venus, that angle would be bigger. So let's suppose, for example, that on Earth, the angle appeared to be 0 0.005 degrees. And from Venus, we would know that it would be 0 0.008 degrees if you were on Venus observing those two locations on the sun. The opposite angle would be the same. And if you split that angle in half, it would be 0 0.004 degrees. And you can erect a right triangle with half of that distance between the observing stations. And once you have this right triangle, it's simple trigonometry again. The tangent of that 004 angle equals 1,800 miles over D. And once you have D, you will have the distance between the Earth and Venus, which is 28% of the distance to the sun. This is the man who actually executed James Gregory's plan. He did careful observations. Two teams did careful observations at different locations mapping the trajectory of Venus across the face of the sun. The result he got was a D of 26,619,600 miles, which was 28% of the distance to the sun. The result he got for the distance to the sun using James Gregory's method was 95 million miles. That is less than a percent off the actual distance that we know the sun was from the Earth on the day of that transit in 1769. Look at that, 0.6%. <clears throat> and even that error was because of something called the black drop effect, which affects the timing of the transit when it's near the edge of the sun. You can see it here kind of affecting the image of Venus. Well, now we have the distance to the sun. And with that, we also have the distance to the planets, thank you, thanks to Kepler. Um, and that is a remarkable achievement. But Christian Huygens came along and took a second attempt at trying to find the distance to Sirius, trying to improve on James Gregory's estimate. And the way he did it was to erect a screen and to get in a dark room behind that screen and use different sized pinholes until he got a pinhole letting sunlight through such that the pinhole resembled the brightness of Sirius. And then he would measure how different the angle of the, the width of that pinhole was in terms of angular diameter compared to the half degree image of the sun. And he determined that the pinhole was 27,644 times less than the sun's angle, meaning that Sirius, if it was the same brightness as the sun would be 27,644 times further that would be what we would today call 0.4 light years. But once again, he didn't know that Sirius was 25 times more luminous than the sun. Had he known that, he would have estimated that Sirius was about two light years away. It's actually eight, but we're getting closer now. Things were getting a little better until Friedrich Bessel came along. Much later, in the early 1800s, he decided to apply this parallax method that Gregory recommended for successfully measuring the distance to the sun, and he applied it to the stars. And what he did was instead of using two observing points, maybe a couple thousand miles apart on the Earth, he chose to use the Earth itself in its orbit around the sun, a baseline of 186 million miles, observing a star from one location and six months later observing it from another and then noticing how far it moved against the background of stars. The first star he applied this to was 61 Cygni, and he was able uh, in 1838 to get a result of 10.3 light years. That's been refined today to 11.4 light years, but he got it within 10%, which was the first measurement using parallax method for the stars. And after that, things just improved. 
Henrietta Swan Leavitt discovered a relationship between certain variable stars and their absolute brightness and was able to establish a relationship between the period of these special sepia variables and their absolute brightness. That turned them into standard candles. And with that, uh, they were able to find sepia variables at the center of the Milky Way and determine the distance to the center of our galaxy. And she was even able to study uh, variable stars, sepia variables in small and large Magellanic clouds, thus determining their distance as well. And then, of course, Edwin Hubble took the sepia variables a step further, finding one in uh, the Andromeda Nebula, as it was called then, uh, which helped him determine, using that as a standard candle, that it was not a spiral nebula within the Milky Way, but actually an entire another galaxy, another quote, island universe, as they used to refer to them, that lay far away from the Milky Way itself. And so that's how we discovered the distance to the stars. And it's a remarkable progression that started with some very bright Greeks and progressed maybe slowly at times, but progressively with some very brilliant people working on it. And Scott, I'll turn it back to you. Wonderful. Okay. Gosh, it's so amazing. I, and, and several of the people on uh, in chat here were commenting how remarkable it was to, uh, you know, have uh, mathematical insights or, or to develop these methods to try to measure uh, uh, the distances. I think some of the the methods were quite clever. So, um, but uh, but it did take uh, it took you know, several hundred years to do it, but, but, uh, but we achieved it. And it seems like now, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I, you know, in this theme of perception, changing perceptions, um, you know, when information like that was first revealed, I think that perhaps there was some, uh, yeah, a great deal of skepticism on distances and and this type of thing, um, and uh, you know, even today, uh, people uh, sometimes have a very tough time believing uh, in the distances and the scale of the universe and all the rest of it. But um, uh, the other thing that uh, uh, that I often think about uh, is, you know, the rate of which our or not the rate of which things happen, but it's not infrequent that we get a, a complete reset of how big the universe is or how old the universe is. You know, I think that we just had another reset here fairly recently uh, that I was reading about. And uh, um, it's, uh, you know, and it's not over, you know, so there's no fixed uh, scientific facts. It seems like it seems like the process of science is to constantly kind of try to tear down uh, uh, a hypothesis or a theory uh, to get at what is a more accurate number. And I'd like to make a comment about something you just said. Um, there are a number of YouTubes out there now that are proclaiming that the universe is 26 billion years old and far larger than we thought. Yeah. Um, and that's based on some JWST observations of seemingly well-developed galaxies that have light travel time to us that places them at a very early stage in the universe's life if it's 13 billion years old. And um, I've talked to some professional astronomers about these, uh, mm -hmm. these YouTubes, and a lot of it is an effort to gain clicks, if you will, uh, Paul Steinhardt has come up with a plausible explanation for why these galaxies appear to be more developed at an early stage, and it has to do with the very large number of massive stars that were created out of only hydrogen and helium before there was a lot of metal available for uh, star formation in the early universe. And uh, so don't be too quick out there to buy into these rather hysterical YouTubes that are uh, claiming wild things about the age of the universe because uh, it's very, very uh, tentative. Yeah. Audie, I wanted to add, you sure as heck weren't kidding when you said how good and fine 
a lecturer Chuck Allen is. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I knew he was good, but I didn't realize that till I heard you say that. And I paid extra attention to today's lecture. Yeah. And I, he really gave me a reset on on my I, my own ideas about the age of the universe. And I really did enjoy that. One of the things that one of the people you did include was Harlow Shapley. I never got to know Harlow Shapley, although I did know his very close friend, Bart Buck, very well. But I, <clears throat> one of the things that if you've ever read his biography from Rugged Ways to the Stars, it would, he, he has a section in it in which he really comes down hard on Henrietta Levitt's, um, what she did with the sea feeds. And she, he says all she did was come up with a couple of stars and come up with the method. I was the one that crashed through on the distances to the globulars. You might have been the one that crashed through on it, but I think you're a little hard on, on Levitt. She really came up with the message, message, which was really, really important. And I just wanted to add that. Yeah. I think that I think that letter by Shapley was actually to the Nobel Committee that was considering Henrietta Swan Levitt. And they asked him for a recommendation and he included that in the letter. Um, yeah. so <laughs> who knows? I mean that was that was something. Anyway, Chuck, wonderful, wonderful presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Another deep dive into <laughs> the universe here. That's wonderful. All right. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Ron Breacher. Ron Breacher goes by the moniker of AstroDoc. Uh, he is uh, uh, one of the leaders of, um, of a group, or maybe is the master of PIX Insight. Uh, Ron Breacher is... Um, uh, you know, an incredible astrophotographer. He shares his work uh, uh, with me routinely. Uh, I think I'm like in a group email or something, but uh, I'm happy to be counted among uh, the people that he passes that out to. And uh, so uh, I will bring, if Ron is on here. Hey. And I don't Great. Hello? Had 18 people there. They had a Coronado PST uh, that they. There we go. I am here, oh, Scott. Okay. Are you there? Okay. Yeah. And All I've right. got my video and everything going. Great. Okay. We had someone else coming on here. <laughs> Ron, thank you so much for coming on to Global Star Party. Thanks for having and, me. By uh, the way, the type... go ahead. I got to say, nice to see that McGill shirt. My dad was an economics prophet, McGill. And I'm, I'm a Montreal boy, of course. <laughs> You're muted. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, um, the, uh, the title of your talk, Ron, is um, Rediscovering the Secrets of the Cosmos. And yeah. So thank you. Let me uh, let me share my screen with you. Okay. And, and uh, start this as a slideshow. You should you should see my screen now. I think we do. Good. So um, you know my titles and my my ideas for talks they all come directly from the information that Scott and Dovid provide, and. Uh, the theme this time really struck me. This is uh, from uh, David. Our fondness for the stars has touched our souls. Boy, do I ever get that. We all share the feeling of discovery, whether the object we found is new to all or new only to us. The thrill penetrates our being as we try to describe how we've been changed by the universe, sharing a secret with us. Boy, that just, it's like you reached in and pulled that right out of my head. Um, so that's thats what I want to talk about tonight. And I'm going to talk about it um, from two perspectives, because let's face it, I've never discovered anything. But I've rediscovered all kinds of things. 
And um, so I'm going to tell you about some of those that had the biggest impact on me. And also, uh, one of the things that has a huge impact on, on how I feel about the sky is watching other people react the first time they see something. And so I want to give you some of the some of the things that I think are the biggest highlights that I've had showing to other people. And uh, I'm going to start out with this image of Carolyn's Rose. This is uh, named after Carolyn Herschel. It's NGC 7789. And uh, it's an open cluster in Cassiopeia. <clears throat> and you'll see the brightest star in the image is this... Uh, orangey red star to the left of the main cluster that's wy cassiopeia uh any any star that's named that way with two capital letters or one capital letter um is is going to be a variable star so t tauri wy cassiopeia and so on so we know this star is variable but again i didn't know that at the time that i rediscovered this star so there's there's the star as it looked in October 2011. And um, five years later, I was with a mirror-making friend of mine in Sudbury, Alan Ward. And he said, you know, that picture of Carolyn's Rose is one of my favorites. Could you shoot it for me again? And I went out in 2016 and I shot the same cluster. And the star was gone. I thought that I had discovered a star that disappeared. I searched for it as well as I knew how to and couldn't find anything about it. So I figured I'd discovered a disappearing star or maybe a Nova. Maybe it was a Nova in 2011. And I sent a message to the Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams. That's where you send uh, messages about astronomical discoveries. It may not surprise you to learn that I never got a reply because this star had been discovered as a variable star back in the 19th century. Only I didn't know it. Um, you may also be entertained to know that the story I just told you is now part of a case study that's told by my friend Rick Husiak out in Saskatchewan. Uh, Rick is a variable star expert and he teaches people on how to do the research to see if something really is a variable star. And I guess I've got uh, some infamy in that case study. Chuck was talking about the Venus transit and I was so lucky. Uh, the Venus transit happened on my birthday in 2012. And I had just got a new hydrogen alpha scope and this blew me away. One of the reasons why the Venus transit blew me away, by the way, I sketched it at the same time I was photographing it. You know, most of the stuff we look at, when we look at the sky, everything looks like it's painted on a flat surface, like a two-dimensional thing. The time where you really get the perception of three-dimensionality of the universe is when one object passes in front of another. And this one only happens every, you know, between 105 and 120 years, and then you get two of them. I'm lucky I got two in my lifetime, and I got to photograph and sketch this. This blew me away. Another rediscovery. So I'm not the first guy to discover quasars. But I find them really, really interesting to read about because they're so far away and they're so bright. And of course, I never imagined that imaging from my observatory that I'd be able to image quasars. But when I made this an annotated image, I included the Milliquas, the Million Quasars Project catalog. And all the quasars in this image are marked in white. And I've circled a couple of them. The top one there, inside these crosshairs, you can barely see it, 9.3 billion light years away. And um, I didn't look up that number. I calculated it. 
So I rediscovered that information. I, I looked up the redshift and uh, I looked at the formula for determining light travel time from redshift. The bottom quasar here that's circled is even further away at 12.8 billion light years. That's tea time after the Big Bang. That's not too long after the Big Bang. So quasars uh, really blow me away. And then um, all with all the newfangled equipment and my imaging gear and my fancy dancy telescopes, <clears throat> it's easy to forget that um, people were being amazed by the sky long before we Anybody on this call was here to appreciate it. And they recorded that, as above, so below, as my wife often says. This is a, a picture I took of the constellation of Leo just with my DSLR one night. And um, here's Leo in the ground. You can see this effigy here. It's part of the Glastonbury Zodiac or the Somerset Zodiac, which is a huge circle of effigies in southwestern England. And you can go and walk there. And uh, many of the constellations of our of our current zodiac and some older uh, effigies are there as well. Fantastic. And, um, you know, I can take a beautiful picture of the Pleiades, but again, I wasn't the first one to notice the Pleiades. This is a, a photograph from the Lascaux Caves on the left. And you can see here a drawing of the Pleiades, the horns of Taurus the bull, and the eye of the bull here corresponding to my star atlas. Here's the Pleiades, the Hyades, and the horns of the bull. So that blows me away too. Every time I go out and look at that stuff, I'm one in a line of people that have been looking at this for thousands and thousands of years. So sharing the cosmos is the other thing that I really love to do. And I've ordered these, you know, more or less from closest to farthest away. Just a few of the things that I like to show people because they're really impactful. Uh, they're not the faintest things that I image in my, in my, uh, imaging endeavors. But when I'm standing out there with my 20 inch job or my 10 inch job with friends, this is the things that we love to rediscover. And the first one, of course, is the moon. And I tend to, I don't know why, but I tend to shoot it a lot on Canada Day. So this is from Canada Day, July 1st, 2020. And, uh, you know, just a little further than the moon are the planets. And uh, I love to sketch. This is just a sketch that I made of Jupiter. By the way, if you are thinking of sketching, if you want to try your hand at sketching something, the easiest thing to sketch is Jupiter. Um, you can you can draw the outline of the planet with that, um, you know, 9% bulge of the equator. You can do that before you go outside. You can even place the major uh, darker bands before you go outside and then fill in details once you get there. So uh, don't hesitate to give that a try. And while we're talking about planets, um, Saturn is absolutely amazing. Uh, I wish this was my photo, but it isn't. It's by my friend, Daryl Archer. He took this image with a, with a new telescope back in March, 2014. And um, probably after the moon, the thing that blows the people my friends away the most is Saturn. You just can't beat it. And I love showing people star clusters, both open clusters, like the double cluster in Perseus. This is fantastic in binoculars. You just can't beat it. It is fantastic in binoculars. Uh, photographs, in my opinion, don't do it justice. Get your binoculars on this object as soon as you can. I also really love globular clusters, but they're a little further away, a lot further away, actually. So I'll come to them in a moment. But planetary nebulas, and in specifically the ring nebula, is fantastic 
visually through an eyepiece. Now, it doesn't look like this. You don't see that outer flower, uh, the pink flower. You don't see that 15th magnitude galaxy to its upper right. And you don't see any of this color. But you see a beautiful, perfectly formed smoke ring. And uh, it's just unmistakable. Very easy to find, even though it's small. It's quite easy to find because it's located equidistant between two naked eye stars. Uh, again, get your telescope on this object. Any size telescope is good on the ring nebula. And I mentioned globular clusters. Uh, my mother-in-law, Joy Bat, this was her favorite object. It's probably my favorite object. I've looked at it in every size of telescope from four inches to 20 inches. And uh, one of the things I always look for visually and I always look for it in any photos that I take of this object, is that there's a propeller feature. Um, this is blown up a little bit. I don't know if you can see it. It's kind of, it's quite dim, uh, but it's darker. It's uh, one vein up here, then there's one sticking out to the right and one down to the lower left. So uh, the next time you're at the eyepiece, let your eye relax and see if you can spot that uh, beautiful propeller feature. I've seen it very clearly in my 10 inch and in my 20 inch. Okay, uh, I said uh, M13 was quite a bit farther away than these other objects. Uh, obviously the moon and the planets are our solar system. The double cluster and the ring nebula are in the main part of our galaxy. Um, M13 is in the halo of our galaxy. Now let's leave the Milky Way altogether. This is my favorite galaxy to show people through the eyepiece. Um, it doesn't look like this through the eyepiece. It looks like a little gray puff of smoke, elongated. Nothing like this. Uh, this is my own photo of it from uh, just from last month, actually. It's not the biggest galaxy and it's not the brightest galaxy, but I think it's the most beautiful galaxy to show people in the eyepiece because it's easy to see and you can put it in the same field with another galaxy, M81, Bode's galaxy. Both of those galaxies are around 11 million light years away and a million light years apart. And just because you can put them both in the same field of view People can see a triangle in their heads and they can get that 3D, that three-dimensional sense of the universe that sometimes can be so challenging to get. Um, so let's come back to that theme just while I close off and then I'm gonna leave you with one, one last rediscovery. Here I've highlighted some of what I've been trying to convey to you, and that is that we all share that feeling of rediscovery. Every time I look at the Ring Nebula, it's almost as it's almost as good as the first, actually maybe better than the first, because I know what to look at. Um, that's such a special feeling, and that thrill really does penetrate my being. I hope it penetrates everybody's being, because by appreciating the beauty that's out there, you're more likely to take care of it. And we, we all need to take care of the planet and of the night sky, of course. And um, I hope you can tell just from the passion in my voice that um, I, I feel honored that the universe shares its secrets with me and that then I can go and share them with my friends and my family. And uh, I said I was going to just leave you with one last little secret, uh, a, a rediscovery <clears throat> or a discovery. And I didn't discover this. My wife discovered it, my wife, Gail, when she was looking at uh, this or one of my earlier pictures of this region. So we have the North American nebula on the left, and uh, you can see it. It's shaped like, like a nebula. Over here on the right, we have the Pelican Nebula which I always thought was a misnomer that we should have called it the pterodactyl nebula as it kind of looks like a pterodactyl to me. 
Uh, but I'm going to show you something now, and you're never going to be able to unsee it after I show it to you. It doesn't have a, a name that I could find or a, a designation in a catalog. So I call it the Lizard Head Nebula. And it's this little guy right here with his head sticking out of the cave. Let me show it to you through my 14 inch. There's the little lizard head nebula. And now that you've seen it, you're never going to be able to unsee it. <laughs> That's right. Thank you very much, Scott, for having Thank me you. on. I'll stop my share. Thank you. That's wonderful. Well, uh, one thing that I would like to say. Uh, one thing I would like to say, Scott, and um, I'd like to, to say that the lecture that I just heard captured the emotion of the night sky, and that is so important. Uh, oh, yeah. I did mention this last week, but I think it's worth mentioning again since you're here, and that is that um, my dad was a student at McGill, oh. and uh, one of his professors in economics was Stephen Leacock. And uh, you didn't learn much about economics from him, but you learned a lot about humor. And dad was at the rotted gates at the front of the university once, bumped into Leacock. And Leacock said, Levy, I have your marks of your on your last test, and you were horrible. It was <laughs> the worst test of anything I ever saw. It was awful. And Leacock went all along about how awful dad did on that test. And finally, he said, Dad, Levy, here is your paper. Enjoy it. And he thrust Dad's paper back at Dad. And Dad took a look at it, and, it's, and, the, and it said, A+, plus, one of the best I've ever seen. Good work. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And Dad, Dad looked up at his professor, Stephen Leacock, who was walking away. And Leacock turned around, waved at him with a big smile on his face. And I don't think Dad ever forgot that story, and I never forgot it either. Well, and coincidentally, I, my dad was in the economics department as well. And I think a contemporary was Stephen Leacock for part of their careers. Yeah, I think that would have been exciting. I never got to know Leacock either, but I do believe that, um, that his humor was just something absolutely unforgettable. And I want to share that with you guys again. Thanks. So thank you, Scott. And I guess I thank you. I, can I share an update with everybody from my last talk? Of I course. had a bunch of things on my bucket list. Yes, you can because it's my turn to bowl. Yeah, one of my one of my uh, bucket list things was to attend Starmus. Yes. And I am now attending Starmus as a volunteer. I'll be working at the Star Party there in That's May. Right. That's right. I'm yep. so excited. So I, I'm very excited to have you. So Thank you're you. the perfect kind of guy to go to Starmus and and to be at the Star Party. So you're going to really, I, I know you're going to be blown away. So uh, it, it's. I'm uh, looking forward a, to Brian May coming and looking through my telescope. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> awesome. Thank okay. you again for having All right. me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. See you later. Uh, thanks. Uh, David, I wanted to just uh, recognize um, uh, some of the people uh, watching. Uh, we've got people watching ag again from around the world, uh, from the UAE uh, uh, into uh, right here in Arkansas. We've got uh, a local on. Uh, we have um, also young Nicolina. Do you remember Nicolina, David? She was recognized as one of the world's youngest astronomers and uh, yes, uh yeah so i'll re i'll read some stuff from her that she's she's posted but i, I asked a question uh, of the audience you know who uh, might have had their uh, perceptions changed and what that what that story was all about and um, uh, john ray had mentioned that uh, he was an engineer um, and uh, he said he said that uh, uh, for me, it was in my teens and well into my 20s after, after I was brought into the, into the engineering field for the first time, I rubbed elbows with people who were much more highly educated than myself. 
and uh, their input caused me to really pause and ponder. Um, Nicolina uh, is studying uh, asteroids. She's doing a citizen science program where she identifies asteroids uh, from one of the uh, surveys that's going on out there. And uh, I think the last time that she was on our program, she had like 18 uh, uh, asteroids uh, detected. She's now up to 55 asteroids detected. And, but she hasn't received any confirmations yet. She said this process takes a long time. So congratulations, Nicolina, for doing that work. Uh, we look forward to having you on Global Star Party once again. Um, and uh, anyhow, anyways, um, um, our next speaker is, um, is uh, uh, Adrian Bradley. Adrian is uh, a photographer of some uh, renowned talent, and she, he is uh, doing uh, incredible work both uh, uh, for, you know, um, what you might call regular photography, but also night sky photography, uh, which he shares with us on his uh, Chasing the Dark series. So, yep. um, Adrian, thank you for coming on to Global Star Party and presenting with uh, David Levy here. Yep, coming to you once again from Saline 300, uh, the bowling alley. Uh, I think it's Station 300 in Saline, where so far I haven't missed a spare. But I told everybody I had a very important uh, date with my friends here at Global Star Party. So let me get on with it. David, I know last time I just talked and talked and talked. But this time I want to share a story even with iPhones, you can share your story. Um, and I'm going to pick the right application. Good to see you, Adrian. It's great seeing you, David. And oh, I'm making an announcement. I am going to attempt, uh, well, not attempt, but uh, I am going to come to um, ALCON, um, Astronomical League's conference in kansas city i've told the wife we're making the trip i hope Great. to see many of you there in person for the first time um i will just share my screen because i think that'll that should work and now i can go where i want to go so i am going to share my trip to um point bark lighthouse park in uh, Fort Hope, Michigan. Hopefully you can see the uh, picture I have of the Milky Way rising that, um, let me see if I can put myself away. Can, can you all see the picture of the Milky Way rising over? Uh, oh yeah, very yeah. nice. So this is what all the night photographers are going after right now. 5 a.m. in the morning, this happens, Milky Way rises. So I'm going to flick through some of these photos i was supposed to get milky way rise here but when you get out of the car on the highway and you see this it stops you in your tracks and that's um i think goes right well with the theme but one night i went to point bark lighthouse park to see the stars and to catch the rising milky way at i think i started at 3 a.m after moonset and and by the way, if you hear any loud noises or announcements, well, I'm in a bowling alley. And let me flip through what I saw. Sometimes the stars have help. Sometimes the aurora is out. This was Solst This was three years ago, spring equinox, and we had a fairly large storm, um, electromagnetic storm, large enough for the aurora to be seen here in Michigan, in the thumb of Michigan, which is around somewhere between 42 and 43 degrees north latitude. So I'm flipping through some pictures where you can see the um, Cygnus and Cassiopeia part of the Milky Way disappearing into the aurora. And here you've got that lighthouse. So I did what I could to capture the moment. This is one of the very few times that the Milky Way played second fiddle. Some of the exposures I used back then this blew the core out. Um, 
sometimes there's more to get than just the uh, galactic center. And as you can see, you can you turn your attention north to the Aurora, you get beautiful pictures. Now, I've processed this a number of different ways, as you're seeing here. But if you are Aurora chasing and you're in Michigan and there's Aurora on the horizon, this might be all you see. This is when you really bring it out, you can bring it out in levels this was the best for me this was kind of the best of both worlds you see what's there but you kind of get the same sense you know that you're there watching it so let's continue we've got some uh, panoramas that i did it was just a beautiful night wasn't too cold turned around i tried some different contrasty things looking back at the lighthouse and then you turn around and you see all of these colors. There is some purple on the crown of this aurora that's visible. Look at all the stars. We talk about the stars. Sometimes it's okay to not see constellations or not see exactly what's there. Just take the entire star field in and realize that every single dot in that sky, there could be a world orbiting that star. Look how many stars. And, and yet there's even more than we can see in our galaxy. And for photographers, you just try and take it all in and capture it in a way where you show people, you say, go outside. Sometimes it's restrictive because you're, this is four in the morning. And I think I had to work the next day and I still made this trip. Um, I probably called in sick the next morning. This is all you can do sometimes. Sometimes the, the terrain doesn't allow you to get the type of shot that you want. You want the galactic center with the lighthouse. You have to go to another lighthouse for that sometime. But um, just look at, you know, Ron Breacher was talking about just enjoying the night sky. Well, here's what it looks like. You're out there. There's some sort of glow coming from Canada across. Um, and then you're looking up over, you're looking over Lake Huron. You're looking up in the sky and seeing endless stars and that faint glow of the Milky Way. Then you go back over, look at some more Aurora, a couple different ways that I've processed the same image. Over time, I've learned to pull a little more detail out. This is one shot, and then this is a different shot at a different time. There's the galactic core rising. Use a little less shutter speed time. You can see the detail, but again, it wasn't really the star. And... Yep, my uh, I'll be leaving soon because my bowling partner just told me it's time to bowl. Well, all good things come to an end. Sunrise began. This is civil dawn, and this is what that same scene looked like with birds flying, landing near the lighthouse. If you've never seen a sunrise, go see a sunrise. Just be careful with your eyes. Uh, once the sun gets to about here, as you can kind of tell, it's starting to get bright and then do some uh, compositions with it. It was cool that morning, but we survived. And so that was my story of, um, of being at Point O'Bark Lighthouse Park March 21st of um, 2001. I'm going to figure out if I can stop sharing here. Here we go. March 21st, 2001, a beautiful night under the stars. And so... Let's see. Am I still broadcasting or did I stop my share? I think I stopped my share. So are you all still there? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, beautiful as usual, Adrian. Yes. And I'm looking yeah, thank you. Right. Yep. Yeah, so right. it's, yeah, it's my turn to bowl, so we'll move on. I'm looking forward to seeing you all, too, at AL Con in uh, Kansas City. I'm going to love it. And uh, if you all out there watching can go, too, I highly recommend it. So now, here, yep. this is okay, my bowling friends. partner. Say hi. hi. He <laughs> wants me to bowl, so I'm going to go. It's been all a right. wonderful star party, as usual, and and looking forward to coming back to share some more of my adventures out in the night sky. All right, Adrian. Thank All you right. so much.
Take Thank care. you all. Okay. Well, uh, up next, uh, David, is Catherine Ald and Kent Martz. Uh, they are uh, going to be leading the um, eclipse event that we're going to in uh, Hill Country of Texas. It's called the Crossroads of the Eclipse's Star Party. And I'm going to bring Kent on now. And I, is, um, is Catherine Ald uh, available as well? Yes, yeah, she's there. I'm here. There you are. Okay, let's bring you on as well. Uh, David, I think that you have met both of these people. Um, you came to Arkansas to do a talk in, at the Shoemaker uh, Auditorium. And uh, I know that you met Catherine during that time. And you've met Kent on a number of times. Um, they were both at the site for the annular eclipse where we're going, uh, and they'll describe more in detail about where it is and uh, you know all of that to our audience. But uh, we have um, a number number of people already signed up for this. Uh, there is still some space left if uh, you're so inclined to uh, uh, join up with us. Uh, David Levy will be speaking at the event. Um, and uh, I'm excited, so I'll let you guys take it away. Hi, everybody. Kent Martz. Um, Catherine and I uh, were at the site for the uh, annular eclipse with a, a small group of people. Uh, you know, it's so close together, one big trip, and a few people made that one, but we're going to have a much larger crowd uh, at the, the site, which is in Texas Hill Country, uh, Catherine, why don't you tell us about the site a little bit and why, well, we know why we chose it, but also it's really it's dark there too. So go ahead. Well, we're about uh, ninety miles as the crow flies uh, northwest of San Antonio. So the San Antonio light bubble is about that big on the horizon, and other than that, uh, there's a town about twenty miles away of four hundred people. So no lights and it's my family property that that's one of the reasons why we're there and the other is well there's an eclipse and totality is just right there so we'll have four minutes and what is it kent 23 26, 26. 26. see i was pretty close and um, and, and it's dark like dark. looking looking to the south you have stars to the horizon so uh, Omega Centauri should be visible about 2 a.m., should be crossing the meridian, maybe five or six degrees above the horizon. So for people who have not not been this far south, this is going to be a treat seeing that big headlight uh, just over the horizon. But uh, when we were there in October, I was just sitting there trying to find a picture of, and I, while, while you're talking, I'll look it up, a picture I took with my iPhone that shows stars to the horizon. With an iPhone, that's a that's how dark it it's is. It's pretty good. Yep, that's dark. I took some uh, 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 light meter measurements from the site uh, and was able to get down to like 21, 21.5, 21.6, something like that. So it is it is a dark site, um, and of course, uh, being close to a total eclipse of the sun. It is new moon too, so it should be uh, extraordinarily good. What was the uh, during the annular eclipse? What was your experience uh, during that time? You know, I know that. How do was, I uh, share my screen? Yeah, Arkansas was clouded out during that time, so it was dark. It was dark, and it was. Was it clear? Yes. Um. It was it was clear most of the nights. We had one night that was sort of cloudy, um, and the morning of the annular, uh, everybody woke up and they were thinking that I was crazy because I told them these clouds will clear, and luckily I was right. Clear. <laughs> I was yeah, right. We were prepared. We were preparing to take off, and uh, you know go chase clear skies, but. We made the choice to stay there, and we did. Uh, I'm sharing my screen now here, Scott. Let me 
Okay. Oh, and I just shared mine. Okay. I'm going to do my reflection photo after you share yours. That's a photo I took with my iPhone. With your iPhone. Okay. With my iPhone. That's definitely and, some good Milky Way there. And not manipulated either. No, right. I've not done anything to it. This is just the it. raw image. Okay. That's just the raw image. Somebody so, at some point is going to teach me how. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it, it's dark, especially to the south and west. Uh, nice and dark. Here we go. So there is a little pond. Oh, yeah. And, you know, again, with an iPhone for 10 seconds, you know, propped up. I think that's handheld, if I remember correctly. I didn't even prop that on, any, on anything. Um, so this little light bubble right here is Lakey, Texas. Um, and that's the light bubble from Lakey, Pretty tiny. Um, which is the closest town we're going to be at. So um, it's dark. And that's why this is not an eclipse event. Well, yes, it's an eclipse event, but it's a star party. You know, this is not just show up the day of the event and then, you know, fight your way into standstill traffic. This is um, come, three come, days on Friday, ahead of time. come on Friday, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, star party. Eclipse on Monday, and we're using Sunday afternoon, encouraging people to uh, make sure their telescopes are polar aligned, practice run with their cameras uh, to make this a truly um, enjoyable experience, right? Um, so i got one other picture I want to show. And then uh, Monday after the eclipse, let's all hang out, relax, chit chat, and leave Tuesday morning. After the traffic lit and that's that's spread. the picture I want to share. Let me get this picture I downloaded a little while ago. Um, because you know, oh. everybody talks about how bad the traffic's gonna End be. The road. Um people you can't imagine how bad this traffic really is. Um let me this is from I'll get it here in a second. Or I won't. One or the other. There it is. Well, the picture's worth it. Well, it's not downloading. I may have to go on to. I know where it is. I did a I did a PowerPoint presentation today on solar astronomy, and yeah. uh, I know it's in there. Had a nice little crowd at the Fayetteville Library. Uh, we used an Exos one hundred with a. Uh, um, first light telescope and people were just blown away by it. Um, so I'm just going to share this PowerPoint window. Let's just do that. So this is the easiest way to do it. There we go. Is that sharing? Yes, it is. Yeah. Put it in presentation mode and you got it set. Did that do it? Perfect. Yes. So this is, so Clint Branham, a good friend of ours, uh, we went drove, we were going to go to a totality no matter what, and we looked at the maps and the weather, and we decided Casper, Wyoming was the place to go. So we drove straight through on, on the day before the eclipse, got about three hours of sleep, and then drove up on the back side of Mount Casper, which is south of Casper, Wyoming, did the eclipse, got the full eclipse over with. And then he said, well, we're going to take the back roads through the Badlands and it won't, traffic won't be as bad. Yeah, we got about eight miles and we sat in this spot for two hours. So normally this, is, this road is about a four hour drive to Denver because I want to go back through Denver because I've never been to Denver. And uh, we sat there for an hour and a half and turned around and drove back to the interstate through Casper. And before we hit the bad traffic jam east of Casper, we uh, got on the state highways and drove through the wilds of uh, southwest um, uh, Wyoming into Nebraska. We made it to um, uh, North Platte, Nebraska at four in the morning. We got up at nine o'clock and, and finished driving home. Now, we have a friend that lives in uh, uh, Fort Collins, which is about a three and a half hour drive from Casper, where she was. Yeah. 
we started driving the next day before she made it home. It took her 16 hours to go three and a half hour drive. Traffic was so bad. And people don't believe it's going to be that bad, but Scott, you experienced it. Yeah. As soon as totality is people, We saw people on the side of the road that had run out of gas. Yep. Uh, people's cars had overheated and broke down. Um, you know, and it was just, um, there was nothing you could do. It's just sit there and wait. Uh, that looks like they're all moving, but they're not. They're stopped uh, for miles and miles. And so that's, uh, that is a, uh, a real frustration, especially when you go, gosh, I could have hung back in Casper, Wyoming, and be drinking a nice cold beer right now. You know, And so. that, Scott, is why we're having <laughs> a star party the night after and telling yeah. everybody, stay, don't worry about it, have another yeah. night nice That's and right. in Bortle 2, looking into Bortle 1 skies, get up the next morning and have a more pleasurable drive home, you know, out of there. Let, let the traffic mitigate. So, you know, it's about 3,000 feet above sea level. Um it's the highest point around. Um, we're going to have a good time. It's going to, you know, as long as today when I speak at the library and she said, oh, good, it's clear today. We can do some. And we did some some looking. And I said, that's all well and good. It can be cloudy every day from now until April the 8th. As long as April the 8th is not it's cloudy, <laughs> I'm happy. It can be cloudy for well, the next let's whatever. Talk about the weather just a little bit. Uh, you know, we studied uh quite a bit we had quite you know of course we knew that this eclipse was coming for quite some time and there is a website called eclipsophile and eclipsophile collects weather data for like 20 years okay on on any given day and uh, uh so you can go search it and see areas that are clearer most of the time than other places uh you know, and so uh, it turns out that Southern Texas, if you're going to be observing this eclipse in the United States, has the best odds for clear weather. Still not a guarantee, you know, of clear weather, but um, the best odds. So the farther south you go, the better it is. You know, the but, better it is. You know, but so again, statistics tell you go, it, it gets even better. But statistics tell you that they can't predict the future. They can only tell you what the average for the past Very was. Very true. And, true. Uh, hopefully somewhere in the United States, people get to see the eclipse. And, you know, I don't, I don't wish clouds on anyone that day. I'm not going to, you know, that's no. like, that's like being in the newspaper business and wanting somebody hoping for a good car wreck or a house fire. Yeah. What if it's your house or your parents, you know, in a car wreck, you never wish for that. Right. So, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, you don't, right. we don't want, any, we want everybody to have a clear day that day. One thing that I could add, Kent, is that the most beautiful, darkest eclipse I've ever seen in my life was totally clouded out. It was March the 7th, 1970, in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And there was this layer of stratus clouds covering the sky. We saw the great shadow of the moon coming in. And during totality, it was so dark, I couldn't see my fingers in front of me. It was just almost black. And I'll never forget that. So because the, the cloud cover caused it to be even darker. The cloud cover made it even darker. I hope it's clear this time. But uh, I'm prepared if it's cloudy to see a very dark, dark eclipse. But where we were in in, in Wyoming, uh, Fred Espinac was like 15 miles, 10 miles north of us. And, you know, the last 10 or 15 minutes of the eclipse, he got clouded out. We could see the clouds. Yeah. So, and, so, so tell the audience who Fred Espinac is. Um, what, uh, Dr. Mr. Mr. Eclipse or Mr. What's Eclipse? Mr. Eclipse. Is, Mr. Is Eclipse. Moniker. Yeah, he's a yeah, but, NASA uh, scientist. He's a NASA scientist. Yeah. Go ahead, world Scott. You know the for his eclipse. Yeah. Yeah, world famous for his eclipse chasing, and uh, he's actually been on on our programs before, but. Uh, uh, he is uh, one busy guy right now uh, preparing for this eclipse. So, and I think, I can't remember how many eclipses. Uh, David Levy, do you know how many he's, he's uh, 
he's seen. I know that uh, he lives in, he now lives in Arizona, um, I think out by Portal. But uh, he's seen, he's, he's seen a lot. Number. He has seen a lot. <laughs> Dozens. Dozens. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so here he's he's got a Wikip. There's a Wikipedia page on him. It says yeah. he's attended more than 20 eclipses, but who knows how current that is, right? Um, you know, yeah, one, one thing I want have been talking to people about, and Clint Brandon was here just a few minutes ago that I went to the eclipse with in Casper. We were so tied up trying to take pictures that we literally have barely looked at since that we're both committing to just sitting there and enjoying the eclipse, enjoying totality and try not to be caught up in documenting yeah. every moment of something that, yeah, you know, I, I see people go to sporting events and they don't see their kids play live. They, they put the camera up in front of their face, face and take pictures and videotape. And it's cool right then, but they're never going to see it again. And, you know, you can make pictures or you can make memories. And I'm going to try and make memories with this one, you know, four and a half minutes and enjoy it with my wife and my friends that are around me and my new, you know, crowd of friends as well. But I, I want to try and make memories, you know, and, and yeah, I'll get some pictures, but, but not have it Can't be about the pictures. Scott? Can't you do both? In four minutes, maybe, but two minutes, two minutes and 20 seconds or whatever we got in Casper, that went really yeah. quick. And, that you know, is, yeah, <laughs> I, I was more worried about the like pictures. every eclipse last is only a short eclipse. Yeah. It never, I, I was more never worried go, about, the, you know, and go, wow, that was really long. I was getting, I was getting bored. <laughs> yeah, that, that's not going to happen. No, that's, that does not happen. <laughs> but I, I just want to. I want to enjoy it, the moment, right? And not just yeah. be hung up and worrying about exposures and focus and all that stuff. I, I want to just I, enjoy it. I want to see the corona. And, yes. you know, and for those people, look, where we sit right here in Springdale, Arkansas, we're 98 and a half percent eclipsed, right? And I have friends that are going, oh, that's good enough. And I'm like, no, no, it's not good enough. You know, Drive. 98. 99 percent 99 and a half percent you know i saw somebody on facebook a few weeks ago say that totality is like having a 10-day all expense paid trip to disney world for you and your family and you get to stay in the castle and you get to go to the front of every line all the food everything's free 10 days and 99 and a half is like loading up in the van with four screaming kids and your wife driving straight through to Disney World, pulling in the parking lot, getting out, stretching your legs, getting back in the van and saying, well, we've been to Disney World, kids, and going back home. That is almost totality. <laughs> but but it's because you were at you were at Disney World, right? You were really close to Disney World. But totality is Disney, right? Yeah. It is cool when that corona appears. Yeah, Kent I, always comes up with an even better analogy of what it's like to. That not one's not mine. See. Not mine. I saw it on Facebook, but I'm. I immediately <laughs> said, "Okay, it's hard." I, at the speech today, there was some some teenagers yeah. there, and I, and they had seen an eclipse in 2017, and they they said, "You can't explain what it is. The emotional impact." Yeah, it's too much. It's, it's the, it is is emotion overload. It is. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. So anyway, crossroads of the eclipses, star expedition to totality okay. is what we're calling this one. So let's talk about let's talk about uh, arrival times. Uh, what's you know walk walk us through this event. So um, uh, gates are going to open on Friday the fifth uh, at noon. Okay. Um, so we're not letting anybody in, uh, after dark, uh, if the sky is 75% clear, um, because it's a star party and we're going to enforce white light regulations. So, uh, you'll have to park and walk if you come in late. And if you're camping, um, you know, we want you there at least an hour before sunset so you can get in and get set up and, and an hour is probably cutting it close, but at least yeah. get you in and, um, 
Uh, it's going to be, you know, a pretty laid back affair. We're going to have speakers. We may have some speakers on Saturday afternoon. Uh, certainly we got three or four speakers on Sunday afternoon with David being, I think, the keynote speaker. Uh, I don't remember what time we've set yet, but uh, there's going to be a food trailer there. We're going to have restrooms. It's dry camping. Dry no camping. Water. No water. No there's no water. Unless, of course, if you want to bring a filter and drink out of the stock pond there, which you can do with the filter. I would do it with filter. But bring your water. Bring your food. When you get close, stop at the last gas station and fill up your gas tank because you want to have gas when you leave. Um, you can bring, you know, small generators, no open frame generators, um, you know, those big loud ones uh, to provide your power. Uh, there's little cell service. Uh, we'll have a Starlink with an emo emergency phone number we're going to provide to everybody. So if somebody needs to contact somebody at the site, they can call that number and get a, uh, uh, get a message to them. We'll have somebody with that phone 24 hours a day answering it, even in the middle of the night and middle of the day. But we're really encouraging people to have a star party, you know, and I've talked to a number of people and they are all coming for a star party. Uh, there's, there's one couple that has bringing their kids, has no astronomy experience, but they're excited to come and be around astronomers for the weekend. They were just excited as could be. So everybody that's coming is going to be astronomers. And uh, we have room for trailers, uh, motorhomes, um, tents. People are camping in their own vehicles, you know, have a bed in the back of their van, whatever. So it's it's going to be a, uh, you know, I know we have one, like a 38 foot this? How motorhome. Do for, how do you sign up for this event? It's real easy. You go to explorescientific.com and yeah. search, just put in the word crossroads and the page comes up. I'll make sure that's right. I'm sitting here in the you office. Could, so you could also go to explorescientific.com. Yeah. If, if you just type in the search bar, type in the word crossroads. And the first thing that comes up is crossroads of the eclipses expeditions. It's $599. That's not per person. That's per vehicle with three people possible in the vehicle so you know if you've got you and two friends who want to come say i want to take john johnson who's joined us and uh chuck <laughs> allen we can all pile into a vehicle and for six hundred dollars we get friday night saturday night sunday night monday night okay so that's four nights that's only and 50, an eclipse and, and an, an eclipse. eclipse that's right for fifty dollars a night go find that anywhere else it's a heck of a deal now if john just comes by himself john's gonna have to pay six hundred dollars so you know john should find some people Bring to share friends. the load and split the gas with um and so. we did say camping but there are absolutely no trees for hammocks yes there's you 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 can bring a hammock and you and lay it on the ground and lay on it or you could spread it um, um uh, in the in the Oh, uh, the mesquite trees and use it as a shade canopy because mm. there's no shade no, either. You know. not, not mesquite. Those are not mesquite. Oh, what we're, are they? We're 40 miles too far south for mesquite. What is um, it? In that area. Uh, mountain laurel. Oh, mountain laurel. Don't eat the red berries on the mountain laurel either. They are very toxic. Yeah. So, Good you humans. know, um, it's Good been time. very dry. One thing we're concerned about, and, and I sent a message out to everybody who had registered yesterday, they've had like six inches of rain last year when they should have like uh, 13, 12 or 13 inches. It's extremely dry. And so uh, no open campfires. You can have a cooking stove on a stable surface, not on the ground. Um, for the smokers, they have to smoke inside a vehicle or a tent. Um, and you know, I start thinking, okay, what if a fire breaks out? So I'm asking people that have them to bring their little one or two gallon pump up sprayers because, you know, if a fire does break out, there's not going to be a fire department there. We're going to have to be our own fire department. And uh, so we do have first aid on site. We've got a couple of uh, wilderness trained um, outdoor first responders who are going to be there. Catherine is one of them. Um who are volunteering to provide, you know, first aid service. Obviously, uh, um, we're not capable of, you know, 
major. The best first aid is don't get hurt. Yeah, best yeah. first aid is don't get hurt, but you not get hurt. Splinters and bandages and cuts and things like that. And sure. you know, um helicopters can land there. We're gonna leave have leave an open spot up on top for a helicopter to land because you know, yeah, uh, if you get hurt bad, we're, you're gonna get flown out, right? Your insurance will fly you out uh into San Antonio. Uh but I, I just can't stress enough, traffic is gonna be bad. If you're coming, you might as well just stay Monday night relax don't go through the stress yeah. you know john where were you at for the eclipse john johnson okay my own yeah i am well i uh for the 2017 one was in a little town called steiner nebraska which is in the southeast corner of the state uh right on the center line uh i was the uh, bill nye for steiner bill was over at beatrice and they got clouded out but we had clear skies and it was awesome yeah how bad was traffic? I stayed at a bed and breakfast. There was a bed and breakfast, believe it or not, in this little town. It used to be uh, where the nuns, they had a parochial school. So uh, we stayed over until Tuesday and we didn't have any traffic problems. <laughs> yep, that's, that's, the, that's way the way to do it. do it. Absolutely. So, you know, there's plenty of room. It's on an old runway. And we just, uh, Catherine is currently assigning uh sites because we've asked we sent a survey to everybody who's who's coming you know what are you camping in so we're trying to put people in spots where they'll where they're fit and Catherine how big are the sites that you're putting together they're 40 feet wide 40 feet wide and between 30 and 50 feet deep depending upon how much spot. the mountain yeah. laurel has encroached on the dirt runway so yeah. you know we're uh we're not packing you in like sardines. You're going to have plenty of room around you to set up and spread out and not feel like you're in a RV park with a trailer that's 18 feet away from you. Right. Right. All right. Well, that's great. So uh, again, uh, you can go to, you can either uh, search for the Crossroads event itself on our site at explorescientific.com, or you can just do explorescientific.com forward slash eclipse. And it'll put you right on to the, uh, to the homepage uh, for all the Eclipse products and, uh, and the event itself. So hope you can make it. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. And I don't know, I'm predicting clear skies. So let's hope. <laughs> let's hope. All let's right, hope. guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, let's see. We've got... Uh, our next speaker is going to be Cesar Brollo. Cesar is uh, down in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And I know that he was out uh, hopefully earlier getting some images, but it might still be clear there now. So let's see what, uh, what Cesar has to say here. Hi, guys. Hi, GSP friends. It's a pleasure to share with the audience. Uh, Again, uh, well, tonight I don't have I don't have a live image um, because it's a stormy weather. Um, e earlier, earlier, um, I had in the forecast that the, the idea that I in Buenos Aires, uh, uh, well, <laughs> the conjunction of the verbs in the past. <laughs> that never appears is that they say we so we have in forest and forecast the the situation uh, uh total totally free of clouds between the seven o'clock and now but the storm that was in the in the forecast that coming from the south came fastly and stronger that we really we we was uh having the, the idea of say okay oh it's a big storm uh but but um i participate last weekend last friday for another virtual um virtual uh, astronomy meeting congress in argentina call it Eveda, 
Um, it was a pleasure to share with my friends um, many, many uh, people that is uh, astrophysics, astronomers, amateur astronomers and professional astronomers. Uh, I really uh, I had the honor to share the sky, the southern sky um, with, uh, in, first of all, was my first time to share image in Spanish, in Argentino, because uh, ever, ever uh, um, I speak English uh, sharing the sky. I say, okay, what's my first, my first uh, sharing the sky, you know, in, in a, because how many, three years we are uh, working the, uh, here, uh, we participate at least three or four years. I, re I don't remember how many times because we started the pandemic time and today is 146, Scott, and <laughs> increasing yeah. the number. Yeah, near... we started in August of 2020. Yes, it's incredible. And this was my first time in making the same in Spanish. Um, I felt to say, okay, <laughs> this is my language, but I, ever, ever, I, I need to, to make this in, in English. And of course that, um, that was a, a great, a great experience and something that, uh, uh like, uh, my son Agustin, uh, had, uh, this weekend for, for run his first, um triathlon is the same name in english the tri triathlon the, the 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 competence of swimming oh triathlon. bike ride yes yes, yes. triathlon and uh, yeah thr triathlon yes yes i don't know if it's a it's a what kind of number uh, you know the word is maybe from greek as in greek um yeah. and uh uh, my my uh, college and friend, uh, we was we had the, the 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 same weekend to transmit the image. Can you believe that this weekend we need to 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 get all the equipment and go to Mar del Plata? That's a city at uh, three three hundred miles from from Buenos Aires, approximately. That is our of is our biggest uh, beach city in Argentina. Is where where many many people in January and February go to the to enjoy the the sun the the sun the sand <laughs> and you know and the and the sea um, and. Uh, Fortunately, was so great because Buenos Aires, in this moment, had a, a lot of clouds, and in Mar del Plata, in another city, we had totally beautiful, beautiful, uh, clear skies. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, tonight I don't have ready uh, a picture uh, that I need process uh, for the next. Uh, but this is a picture of Agustín. Agustin made a, a great picture of Eta Carina Nebula from the balcony in the, from the city of Mar del Plata. Um, but this for for I, I I tell him that he needs to make a presentation because ever ever is me, but we, we need young people in the in the global South Park. Um we are young, of course, but younger. And um well, I share. The experience I share the screen. Let me see if where I have um well maybe if here you you're watching the the ah okay yes because it's the the PSP presentation. You can see the presentation, Scott. Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Uh, we can um, MDQ Mar del Plata 
Mar del Plata. It's have something with this Q, something interesting because Q is the the symbol, the chemical symbol for the plata for 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 the uh, in English is plate. It's is a um, you have a gold or you have a, a silver. Sorry, silver, not plate. Silver, Mar del Silver. Silver is the mineral. Well, and they they need to change the the code for for uh, their own airport because MDP does existed in the past and they need to use MDQ. And this is the name of Eveda, the virtual meeting that uh, our friends, do you remember the people uh, in the in the windy eclipse? Um, the people from both cities. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes. I thought, I thought yeah, just, I we thought. we got it. You, you helped us. Yes, yes. Eclipse. Don't worry. Right. Don't worry about the, the, the weather in the eclipse because we still alive <laughs> with a, a winter, uh, no winter, a wind, a very wind situation. Maybe, maybe it's normal in, in the eclipse sometimes, especially in Patagonia. But I I thought I think that you are having a, a gray gray weather in in Texas. Well, and this is our our um, really I stop to work and I just drive and go from Buenos Aires to Mar del Plata. I rented an apartment, finding an apartment with an open balcony, Scott, and say mm -hmm. oh, it, it was I was lucky. Because how many possibilities do you have and say, okay, I need to rent an apartment by booking application and say, right. okay, but I, I, I need open balcony for what? To put telescopes. The the owner of the of the <laughs> the owner of the of the apartment that rent me the 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 location told me yeah. we maybe he thought you know the, the black the black cases and maybe they say, okay, this is a sniper. I don't know if this <laughs> is safe. This, <laughs> yes, yes. Hmm. Every every amateur astronomers are we we really we pay the yes, people pay I, attention I, in I us that. because say yes yes Many I can imagine law enforcement people. Uh, <laughs> yeah yes yeah. sure in, in the eclipses is. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, this is the the telescope we had prepared. Um, we need to drive a uh, safe bus, but in the just time, we need to go to the apartment. We need to to prepare the telescopes. I use two telescopes because it's more safe than on one. And um, here is Agustin. In, in another part of the of the table, and this is the the city of, of Mar del Plata. The problem is that maybe around Mar del Plata, I have places uh, with um, less uh, light pollution. But the problem is that you know that <laughs> I need to rent something. You you don't need if the place is safe or the it exists a lot of problems. But well, we resolve. In this apartment that worked very very well, um, we was ready to to transmit the sky. We have a lot of of uh, different uh, objects for the southern hemisphere. Um, for example, uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't have uh, recorders, but um, the some people send me. For example, this is Omega Centauri, the galaxy. From the other people in the in the screen that we show to the people, maybe do you, you, you know the the hamburger galaxy? You know, yes. This is it. Uh, maybe if we are if we are lucky, next next uh, global search party, I try to to show you from the rooftop a live image of of Omega Centauri. It's possible to make something live, sure, sure. because. And sorry, this is, uh, sorry, Cesar. That's not the Hamburger Galaxy. That's the Alfajor Galaxy. Ah, yes, for Argentina. Well, 
Maxi, you told me something that I you told me the problem to 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 explain the Argentinian things to the people. Sometimes, I'm talking about alfajores. You have to bring me alfajores. Remember yes, that. Yes, ah, uh, yes, yes. I understood completely because Maxi, Maxi is sad because all people that go to the to the to the Mar del Plata bring alfajores that that maybe do you remember Scott that alfajores is something uh, Max explained that is alfajores it's like a small cake very very oh very uh, tasty uh full of yes. chocolate dulce de leche uh, I share a link in terrible, the chat okay. yes yes <laughs> But next I time, Maxi. See. Next time, yes. We we went to the to the triathlon in an order to to be a, a health condition because you know I I don't run the triathlon the triathlon. <laughs> well, this is a, 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 um, another capture of the screen of another people. I was uh, we was uh, a, um, showing the Tarantula Nebula that. That many times we watch it in in the in this show, and this is this is what was interesting. It's some some experiment that we need to make again. But because um, uh, do you remember maybe the Beta Cruxis and the Red Star of um, uh, wow Cruxis? Do you remember Maxi the name of the of the um, El Rubí or? Or we call it el rubí or la gota de sangre. Oh, the, the that blood, is the, yeah, the redest, uh, the redest star in the, um, in the in the sky. And we, uh, I found something interesting because maybe in the in the quiet image, uh, Scott, you, you don't see the difference between the red and the blue. But I started to yeah. to move the telescope with the hand control with the cell phone. And mm -hmm. you can see the trace totally, totally different, a very red and blue maxi to uh, the difference of colors because you have, uh, instead that, that, the, that the CCDs don't have uh, anti-blooming, the, the professional CCDs or the, the coolant CCDs, but yes. you lost the color in a live image. And, and when you move the telescope, you can see the colors Oh, you can see the colors. That's right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that it's something of, that I like. The I, smearing of, of the, I don't know if it's because uh, it's there for a shorter exposure or whatever, but you're absolutely yes, right. Yes, short exposure, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, because and it makes Star Trail uh, photographs, even back during film days, would show the colors of stars much better than like a long. Yes, duration. absolutely. That, that's that's and was, true as well. Yes. Yes. And mm -hmm. uh, um, I I was happy moving the the telescope and um and uh, of course that we uh, uh, something that uh, these guys are friends and say well when <laughs> another uh, the um uh, our friends in another part of, of the of the uh, meeting say well come on after when... this guy sorry. Ah, uh, sorry. I, 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 um, that was very, very interesting. That um, it's like a experiment for for people, for the kids that are interested, and it's something easy to to see. And this is captures of the of the center of the event in in the Patagonia, where they they was um, uh, making the transmission. And here is is the for example here is all about the group of cities. Mm -hmm. um, we make a, and this is well uh, the staff of organization: Joe Alperin, Guillermo Abranson, Gabriel Bengochea, my friends. Do you remember when we when uh, coming from from the Patagonia and uh, we talk in the in the in this trip. Uh, with you, Scott and Gabriel, coming with me in the car, because we was returning from the from the um, special uh, uh, meeting for astronomy in in Viedma, Patagonia, and this is, is a capture of the of the screen 
with many friends and people that are yeah. really, really, yes, really a great, a great staff of uh, physics, amateur astronomers, uh, you know, um, really, really was a great, a great, uh, an interesting, interesting meeting. I can share um, in the same way. I don't know, sorry. Let me, ah, oh, okay. Hi, Maxi. ¿Qué pasa? Ah, uh, now, yes. All right. Sharing now. Okay. You know that if we don't have problem with sharing a screen, we are not in the global star party. Yeah, that's the law in the, of the GSP. Uh, yes, it is a, it's a very important. If not, it's the it's, it's real a, log of the GSP. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> yes, it's a spy or something different. Spy yeah, that's yes, right. absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I show you in the in the web page of the of the Veda. You can see now um, there are the disertantes, uh, Matias Aldarriaga. Doctor in Física Gabriela González is the is the author for the ondas gravitacionales. Is is, a, is uh, ma many of them work actually in United States. Uh, you can see Louisiana State University, University for Advanced Studies. Uh, maybe we can contact for next global star parties, Scott. I can I can contact them. I would love that. That would be great. Yes, yes. Diego Golom, Daniel Golombek, sorry. Um, this is this is an staff that it's a luxury staff. Guillermo Abranson that explained the, the pictures while we was what was uh, showing to the audience, and he's a he's a research in Conicet. Gabriel Bengochea, my friends. My co-keeper Mariano Rivas from the planet from the planetary of Buenos Aires, Cinta Quinteros, Andrés Raviolo, Diego Diego Galperini is the is the the master the 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 brain of all of this is is the man that is a great great uh, amateur astronomer and specialist in in all about how to explain how to teach astronomy is mm -hmm. doctor in in this is specialized in education, but concerned and the group of a series, the group of the kids, the, the students of uh, high school students, is uh, he formed from many, many generations of students. And this is really great. Another friend, Pablo Gonzalez, Joseph Gonzalez is, is actually um, uh, uh, he he worked in the University Autónoma de Barcelona. Marcelo Álvarez, Enzo Bernardini, a great friend that that I know from his uh, was an, an teenager. Uh, Leonardo Heredia, uh, they was an excellent, an excellent. Maybe do you do you think I I I say okay, it's full of excellent excellent stuff and me. <laughs> um, you know this guy, okay. And this is uh, well, a lot of collaborators and and people that work a lot in in three days uh, and really was an an excellent excellent meeting that we are thinking in make in, 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 in next year, of course. And and finally. Something short that is uh, the last um, open cluster that we show last global star party. Um, oh. I I show you just I I um, recover some exposures that we made in life and uh, I make a, an an fast uh, and fast uh, process. Well, here I'll show you to the audience 
the where is the the, the cluster you remember that we had last week this one in a position where was uh, uh, outside the ca the the field uh, because I had the roof the roof of my balcony uh, covering the part of the sky of the um, Eta Carina Nebula, but we we uh, uh, could capture this cluster. Okay. And I'm going to show here you have the the process edit match. Of course, that is not something perfect. It's not, I'm not Maxi, remember. I am Argentina, but I'm not Maxi. Maxi have a picture that is totally uh, how do you say uh, mind blowing? Mind or, blowing. It, Mind blowing, yes, yes, but <laughs> for me it's impossible to make these things that makes up a maxi. But I think that that I'm happy uh, with the small information that I I could capture uh, because was the, was the auto auto self stacking, you know, auto stacking. Um, here we have a lot of stars. Look the difference between the blue and the red stars. This is very interesting. Open clusters sometimes are outside the, the interest of the object in the skies, but uh, uh, the science about the open clusters are very interesting and have a lot of secrets about their, their uh, gravity forces that are very interesting to understand understand more about about gravity it's very interesting that uh, I listen many many times astronomers that work in open clusters and really is something that that uh, is uh, something to to know to to, to be uh, interested in things well this is my all presentation for tonight rainy day stormy night in Buenos Aires <laughs> And, uh, well, this is all for, for tonight. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank, you. thank you to the whole audience. Thank you to you, Scott, for inviting me. And, um, well, I'm still enjoying the, the show. <laughs> Great. Great. Thank you. But thank okay. you. Okay. All right. So our next, uh, our next speaker, uh, David, is going to be Robert Reeves. And I know that you really enjoy... Uh, all of his knowledge about the moon. How would you rank? I mean, David, you've met many, so many astronomers. Uh, how would you rank uh, Robert Reeves as far as his knowledge of of the moon with uh, other astronomers that you've known? I would think I would think he's right up there with the best of them. I think the person who probably knew more about the moon than anybody else was Gene Shoemaker, but Robert wow. is really right up there with it. And I think yeah. if Jim were here now, he would say, go for it, Robert. <laughs> well, thank you for that uh, that comparison. That that really, really touches my heart because uh, I've met Gene Shoemaker and uh, um, he's an absolute science hero of mine because he would get out there and get dirty in the desert, in the dirt, doing the research, crawling in the holes in the ground. So uh, and he, he was no armchair um mathematician type astronomer he actually got out there and dug in the ground to get his evidences and and uh, make his theories so uh he was a really special person great well okay you've got the stage already well um <clears throat> yeah glad to be here and kind of slow down and relax uh, the whole day has been supersonic like i've been pushing a whole box full of wet noodles but uh um Tonight, uh, uh, we'll um, kind of jump back and forth in time. Uh, the uh, The whole theme of this thing is uh, uh, the uh, uh, changing perspectives of uh, how we see things in astronomy. And the moon certainly has gone through its um, changes in perception over the years. Uh, 
let me get my screen share going and uh, do that great experiment and uh, make sure that this actually goes and you are now screen sharing. Boom, yes. Hopefully we got my uh, title slide up there. And uh, we'll move on to my first slide, which is standard in all of my moon presentations. You've seen this slide again and again over the many times that I've uh, been on Global Star Party. And it's a very important piece of information. Everything we see on the moon was created by either Robert, an impact. You're, you're just showing thumbnails right now. Uh oh, nuts. Uh, yeah. Uh, let me see. How do I how do I get back out of this? Um, still thumbnails or am I? Sh still thumbnails. Okay. Uh, okay. How do I do this? We've done this before. We can get past this little. Hmm. Oh heck! How do I do this? How do I do this? Okay, let me go back here and something is not. You might want to stop sharing. You want yeah, to oh, to oh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what I need to do. Take you out. I can yeah, do okay. Back I, okay. I could do Okay, now let go. me. Okay, now let me find the rest of everything and bring you. No, I do not want to start fire capture. That was the wrong maybe, button to push. Sorry, maybe if you open, um, yeah, open that's, one of the of, of the two nails. That's, um, what I'm, that's what I'm doing. And now I'm trying to yeah. find, find but Of back. course, that is, is the same that I said a few minutes ago, that it's it's our, our mark of, of so I had the same problems with this. Yes, yes, I'm totally. Yes, I've run into it too. The system is is not so friendly, really. Okay, now do you see? Okay, my... perfect. Already, <laughs> oh lordy, uh, I I do not know why Global Star Party is the only platform where <laughs> my Zoom doesn't work right. I really can't answer that question, but mm. uh, trust me, I've done a ton of Zoom presentations and it works flawlessly, except yeah, here. Yeah, well, anyway, uh, we're, we're, we work our way through it with the group expertise. Oh, so I hope you're seeing that uh, primary landscaping process slide that I was talking about. I begin almost all of my lunar presentations with this because this is a very important piece of information to know about the moon. Everything we see on the moon through a telescope or uh, by spacecraft orbiting the moon was created by only two different processes, either the impact of a meteor, asteroid, or a comet, or the subsequent volcanic modification of the lunar surface. So uh, with that little piece of information, which uh, the realization of it didn't come until fairly recently in the um, time scale of lunar studies, um, uh, we had Apollo astronauts on the moon before uh, these the two basic truths were universally accepted by by astronomers and geologists. So. Uh, um, uh, the perception of how we understood the moon, um, it's taken a long time to get there. And it's only within our lifetime that uh, we uh, have a universal understanding of how the face of the moon came about. So uh, pressing on, uh, come on, there we go. Um, the basic full moon. Uh, let's drop back to antiquity. Uh, the moon was perceived by the ancients various civilizations to be a god in the sky. Uh, it wasn't until uh, uh, the Renaissance period where uh, uh, great thinkers began to realize that the, uh, uh, the moon was an object in orbit around the earth. Um, some uh, early Greek mathematicians and astronomers suspected that, but uh, uh, it wasn't until uh, telescopic astronomy um, over 400 years ago when uh, uh, Galileo first applied the telescope to the moon and then uh, other astronomers followed that uh, 
we accepted the moon as a separate world. But 400 years ago, in the crude era of early astronomy, uh, telescopic astronomy, uh, the astronomers thought the dark areas on the moon that we see uh, uh, create the caricature of the face of the man on the moon, uh, they thought those were actual watery oceans like the terrestrial oceans on the Earth. So uh, it uh, took a couple of hundred years to sweep that aside. And uh, in the meantime, um, various uh, uh, astronomers started charting the moon through a telescope. The first was Langrenus, and he applied a whole bunch of different names to the moon, uh, features on the moon. Uh, but um, uh, although he was uh, one of the first to chart the moon, his um, choice of names didn't stick. They were very politicized, uh, favoring royalty and uh, um, um, people who sponsored him uh, and, and various regions uh, in Europe, which kind of made the other royalty not too happy. So uh, his his uh, names fell by the wayside fairly quickly. Um, Hevelius, the uh, um, Polish astronomer, um, did an excellent job of charting the moon, uh, named uh, lunar features um, in his own uh, uh, way of doing things. But uh, here we see like um, Copernicus Crater. He has it listed as Mons Etna, a mountain. Uh, the same with Tycho, Mons Sinai. Uh, they are, these are craters, not mountains. Um, so uh, um, almost all of Hevelius's names have gone by the wayside. Uh, around the same time, um, Giovanni Riccioli, uh, Italian monk, uh, created the system that we now use for naming the moon. Um, he uh, named all of the major dark mare areas, uh, Procellarum, Imbrium, Serenitatis, uh, Crisium, Tranquillitatis, the familiar names. Now, the ones around the outside of the uh, the lunar globe we see here, Humboldtiana, Manguis, Marginus, those Austral, Oriental, those were added later uh, in the uh, um, 19th and early 20th century. But um, toward the middle of the moon, just above uh, Tycho Crater, you notice uh, uh, there's Mare Nubium and then go up one more, Mare Cognitum, and above that, Mare Insularum. Those last two, Cognitum and Insularum, were named during our lifetime. Indeed, since I graduated from high school, uh, Cognitum in 1964, Insularum in 1976. That is so recent that I had bought the house I am living in now in 1967, uh, 1976 when Mare Insularum was named. And uh, that uh, particular Mari came about a rather curious way. Um, um, Don Wilhelms got a uh, very famous lunar geologist, uh, got tired of Harold Mazursky proclaiming that there can only be one ocean on the moon, Oceanus Procellarum. So he went out to, to, to rename another portion of uh, uh, Procellarum, partition it off, and have it named Oceanus Insularum, uh, the Ocean of Islands, so named because of all of the mountain peaks that protrude through this particular area, uh, uh, Mari area on the moon. But the IAU um, initially approved that, but by the time the name came out in print as official, it had reverted back to uh, 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 Mari Insularum. So uh, Harold Mazursky still had his one ocean on the moon. But moving on, because uh, this covers almost a 400-year time span of naming things on the moon. Um, uh, Robert, we lost your audio. You are in, in, you have muted. Yeah, the problem with the, the mute go. the mute is real close to those arrows that I advance with. <laughs> okay, we've done that before. <laughs> I'm doing all the tricks tonight. Well, anyway, my, uh, uh, Riccioli, 400 years ago, uh, not only named some of the uh, areas that we still recognize on the moon, uh, the, the dark areas and so forth and craters, he named the bright areas on the moon. Um, like uh, right in the middle, Terra Sanitatis, the the uh, uh, the the, the uh, land of cleanliness. Below it, um, 
terra fertilitatis, fertili the, the land of fertility. Um, these names fell out of uh, favor in the early 1800s. Uh, we no longer have separate names for the bright areas on the moon like we did, uh, well, like we do with the dark areas. So uh, changing perceptions again on the moon. And let's make sure I hit this button correctly this time. Um, but throughout all this time where, where these people were mapping the moon, um, maps of the moon in print look terrible. I, I don't even recognize this as the moon. And uh, I, I probably uh, I have a, a better um, geography recognition of the moon than anybody, but uh, 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 maps of the moon from 100, 200 years ago, uh, they may as well be a, an alien planet. So uh, getting a little bit closer uh, to, uh, to what we see, here's a picture of Earthshine, um, the uh, shadow side of the moon illuminated by sunlight reflected off of the Earth. Uh, we see the, uh, the regular phase of the moon below the crescent, but the rest of it is illuminated by uh, light reflected off of the Earth. And uh, um, back in the uh, early Renaissance period, um, various astronomers profess that, well, the moon is translucent, um, uh, and uh, this is sunlight shining through it. Others thought, well, the face of the moon is phosphorescent, and uh, in the shadow side, it glows. But nowadays, we, uh, we recognize what it is. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci was actually one of the first to deduce that Earthshine is light reflected off of the earth, but uh, his uh, thoughts on it were published until the 1700s, long after his death. So uh, Galileo gets first crack at uh, uh, major publication uh, in Siderius Nuncius, where where he analyzed the, the situation and correctly deduced that uh, Earthshine was reflected uh, light sunlight off of the earth. So uh, that's me, yes. Um, more changing perceptions about the moon. All of my life, until I visited Ewing Whitaker's house in uh, Tucson, Arizona, a number of years ago, uh, Whitaker was um, one of the early uh, people at the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory with uh, Gerard Kuiper, uh, and he helped create the famous uh, Kuiper Photographic Lunar Atlas. Now, all of my moon career, uh, if I, you could call it that, um, I have revered the photographic lunar atlas put out by Kuiper and, and these people, but I had never seen one. I thought it was supposed to be this magical thing that had all these marvelous pictures. Well, this is the first time that I saw it, sitting on the floor of uh, uh, Whitaker's moon room at his home in Tucson, and that deer in the headlights look on my face is my realization that these photos in this atlas that I had so revered all of my life were absolute junk compared to what we do nowadays with our own amateur telescopes from our own backyard using digital imaging. So uh, uh, I got brought back into the 21st century in a hurry uh, <laughs> right then and there. So. Uh, moving on with changing perceptions, um, my my concept of the moon is 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 still changing. Uh, I took this picture on uh, July nineteenth, twenty eighteen, and uh, I know that well because I spent two hours last night reprocessing this very same photo, and uh, going through it just detail by detail, getting it right. So uh, it, it's a constant learning process, what the moon looks like, what's real, what's not. And uh, um, I could probably spend the rest of my uh, my living days going through the moon pictures I've taken and hand correcting everything, every little blemish and every little um, artifact in them. But uh, the, the fact that we can do stuff like this from our own backyard is, is just absolutely marvelous because these these pictures like this just blow away what used to be or what was in the uh, famous Kuiper lunar atlas. Now, um, progressing up through the space age, early 1960s, uh, this was 1965, actually. Um, here we are. Um, the American space program is finally succeeding in getting spacecraft to the moon. Ranger 8 
specifically is what I will get to in a moment. But uh, here we see the, um, a shot taken through my telescope of Sabine and Ritter craters. In 1964, the big argument amongst uh, professional astronomers and geologists were that Sabine and Ritter were volcanic calderas. So 1964, that's how late people were still absolutely convinced that there's Vulcan, uh, uh, the, the craters on the moon were created by volcanism. And then we started sending the Ranger spacecraft to the moon and started getting the preliminary first close-ups of the moon. The uh, first Ranger went up in uh, January of 64 and it failed. It crashed into the moon without taking a single picture. But Ranger 7 followed that summer and uh, was a spectacular success. Um, we recognize Garrick Crater here as the spacecraft drops a lower and lower broadcasting picture after picture after picture before impact. And then finally, the final frame just before impact, uh, several hundred meters above the moon. The experts look at this and those who thought the moon surface was hard and would support a spacecraft were convinced that it was. Those who looked at this picture and thought the moon's surface was soft, billowy dust, and swallow up a spacecraft were convinced that's what it was. So uh, hmm. it really didn't prove much. <laughs> so uh, uh, perceptions didn't change all that much. Now here's Sabine and Ritter again, as seen by Ranger 8. You know, compare it to uh, the picture taken from my backyard. Uh, not that much difference. But uh, still, it did not prove one way or another. Is Sabine and Ritter volcanic calderas? Couldn't tell. Um, more chasing volcanism on the moon. Ranger 9 zoomed up to the moon in early 1965. And um, everybody in the United States was able to, to watch this if they cared, because NASA broadcast the images live on national television as Ranger 9 got closer and closer and closer to the moon. And the, this view of Alphonsus Crater, uh, they were searching for signs of volcanism in Alphonsus. Now, we can clearly see past evidence of volcanism, and we'll jump up to the next photo, which was taken with my telescope, and very similar to the Ranger 9, but you notice that the 9 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 5.30 positions, the dark spots of volcanic ash blown out of volcanic vents. So yes, volcanism occurred there at one time, but is it still ongoing? Nope. I'm uh, afraid it's not, uh, chasing another uh, volcanic goose chase. Now, here we are, 1971. The Apollo landings are well underway. We're, we're up to Apollo 16. Apollo 16 landed uh, just north of uh, Descartes Crater um, in a, on that smooth plain where the little Winter goes. Uh, today we call those Cayley Plains, named after the smooth uh, um, areas around uh, the crater Cayley, just uh, west of Mars Renatatis. Um, but um, the term applies to um, any smooth area uh, that's been filled in with, with debris and ejecta thrown from a basin impact. But when they sent Apollo 16 up there, they thought this was a volcanic field. Uh, ancient lava beds. Uh, John Young and Charlie Duke set um, the uh, uh, Apollo 16 lander down, and the first thing John Young saw out of the window, rocks, lots and lots of rocks, not volcanic smooth uh, uh, lava flows. So uh, even as late as Apollo 16, they were completely wrong in the assumptions about lunar geology. So uh, uh, the, the we're we're getting really late in the astronomy game, uh, uh, just 50 years ago, and we still don't understand fully. Still didn't fully understand the moon. Now, um, another thing that uh, puzzled people, uh, astronomers for centuries, crater rays, and we see the spray of rays splashing across the entire southern hemisphere out of out of Tycho. Uh, crater rays were called a an enigma wrapped in a riddle. Uh, the, they didn't understand what they were because they didn't uh, comprehend that craters were formed by impacts. Uh, the giant explosion that created the crater splattered this ray material across the face of the moon. And uh, the same with Kepler crater. 
very distinctive ninja star looking ray pattern or um, well Copernicus as well but uh, we'll go one more picture here's here's Kepler again uh, setting the stage next to Copernicus crater and Copernicus uh, uh, the ancients used to call it the monarch of the moon uh, uh, here we see the the ray pattern of of uh, from Copernicus splattering uh, over a thousand kilometers across the face of the moon. Um, only after the impact origin of craters was finally universally accepted did we understand what the crater rays were. Uh, ejecta blasted out of this crater, uh, out of the craters by by the impacts. And then we came to realize that, uh, well, every crater doesn't have a ray system because rays fade in time. Uh, they're um, splashed across the surface, draped across the surface. And as meteoric impacts continue on and on and on over the millions of years, uh, after about a billion years, it gardens the, the, the surface and erases the rays. So uh, Tycho looks pretty now. Uh, Copernicus looks pretty now, but uh, come back with me in about 500 million years, and we're not going to see these rays anymore. Hmm. <laughs> um, getting down to the uh, end of it, uh, other perceptions of the moon that's changed. Um, straight wall is a very popular non-crater target on the moon, just this linear uh, ridge that it casts a shadow here as we see it at sunrise. And... Uh, uh, later on, as the sun is higher, uh, well, uh, this picture here, um, perpetuating the perception that straight wall is this imposing sheer cliff uh, artwork from the 19, uh, early 1900s uh, all the way up to the beginning of the Space Age, uh, uh, like this Chesley Bonestell um, painting, uh, depicted straight wall as this imposing straight drop-off cliff. Well, um uh, Straight wall isn't necessarily a cliff after all. Uh, here we see it uh, casting a, a thinner shadow. The sun is up higher. Uh, straight wall is actually um, a um, not that steep of a slope, uh, about 20, 25 degree inclination slope. I predict that a spirited astronaut in the future could traverse this thing on foot if they're very careful. So uh, another quick look at straight wall at sunset. And here we see that slope face fully illuminated by the setting sun. So uh, uh, straight wall is another feature that's gone through a change of perception over the uh, 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 past recent decades. So um, yeah, that's over with quick. <laughs> My usual ending slide. Uh, there's much to live on the moon. And I invite everybody to come out and join me on my playground. The, the moon is available in your own backyard. It uh, laughs at light pollution. It's a marvelous view and even the smallest of telescopes. And uh, all of these features I've been talking about that uh, puzzled people for so long and uh, finally came into focus just in the space age are, are right there for you to observe and enjoy every night. So uh, I uh, invite you to come out and uh, play with the moon with me. Yeah, there. Great. Robert, I really enjoyed that. I, uh, your knowledge of the moon is second to none. Well, thank and you I, very much. But uh, I would like to show you my own little map of the moon, which I keep on. This is the book that I have all of my poetic quotations in that I use ah. most. And there is a map of the moon on its cover. Ah. And it is very partly good. based on, uh, on the... Uh, craters I identified myself during the 1960s from the mm -hmm. Sky and Telescope lunar map. Yeah. And I just wanted you to see that. Well, uh, welcome to my world. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Okay, all right. So uh, David, our next speaker is uh, John Johnson. Um, John is uh, the one of the leaders of the... Uh, um, Nebraska Star Party. Uh, he is, uh, a, you know, lifelong astronomy outreach enthusiast, uh, visual observer, um, and um, has made uh, the Nebraska Star Party what it is today. And so I wanted to bring him on to 
uh, have him talk about the reasons why you might want to go to one of the darkest sites in the whole world, which is up in, uh, in Nebraska. Okay, take it away, right? Yeah, take it away. How's my vo uh, volume? Can everybody hear me? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Scott. Uh, this was a bit of a surprise. Uh, I regret my absence from the Global Star Party for quite some time. I won't go into the details, but suffice it to say, it's been some health issues I've had to deal with. But anyway, uh, Scott called me at 930 this morning and said, hey, you want to be on tonight? So how can I turn that down? I said, of course. So I've uh, scrambled around. I I uh, have a PowerPoint. I'll go through uh, some of it. I'm sure if you've been on and saw me before is going to be repeat, but um, it'll refresh your memories as to who and what and where we are. So I guess uh, without any further ado, we'll try it. Uh, it seems like everybody always has a little issue getting their PowerPoints. So I'll what, share screen, right? Share screen. Yeah. Bring it up. Now, will it go to full? Uh, it's, uh, you're on the right application, but you there just we need go. to take it presentation mode. Now, there you go. Perfect. There we go. Let's see if the button works. Okay. It, it looks like it's working. Yeah. Okay. Just real, real quick, I'll, I'll breeze through this as fast as I can. Uh, we're uh, a fully registered 501c3 nonprofit chartered to promote and encourage both public and private astronomical observing activities. Uh, we encourage dark sky friendly outdoor lighting practice in the state of Nebraska. And we sponsor an annual star party at what's called Merritt Re Reservoir. Actually, it's a state recreation area up in north central Nebraska, which is about 35 miles southwest of the small town of Valentine, Nebraska. Uh, this year, 2024, will be our 31st year of holding the star party. Uh, here's a map of Nebraska. As you can see, there's Valentine. We'll zoom in there. Oops, too fast. Back up one here, right? Okay, we slipped out. Oh, Frey, let me back up one. Things very sensitive, I see. Okay. <laughs> it wants to bounce on me here, I guess, huh? There we go. Okay, uh, the, it's right by uh, what's called the Samuel McKelvey National Forest, which is more grasslands, Sandhills grassland than forest, but there's a, a lake there that's called Merritt Reservoir. Here's why we go there. And I'm sure many of you have seen this uh, synthesized image of what light pollution has done uh, in the whole United States. Uh, as you can see, anything, uh, East of this line, which is kind of the western edge of North South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, on down to Texas, is almost impossible to find a really dark sky. We'll zoom in to what the Nebraska area there. Uh, for reference, here's Omaha, Nebraska. Here's Denver, uh, uh, Kansas City down here. But as you can see, we have this proverbial black hole in north central Nebraska. The reason being, of course, a very sparse population. There are more cattle in that area than there are humans. Here's a close up of that dark area, and X marks the spot. That's where we hold the Nebraska Star Party annually at the near the new moon in either late July, or early August. Uh, it's uh, incredibly dark skies. I heard earlier uh, Kent and Catherine talking about where you're going to have your solar star party here in a few weeks. Uh, I'll beg to say that our site is just as darker, darker up there in north central Nebraska. I'll show you pictures here a little bit later. Okay, we emphasize education. We hold an astronomy beginners field school for all ages. We hold two three-hour sessions on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday, we have a full lecture series at the Valentine High School, and we also uh, offer a children's program for K through seventh grade uh, during that Wednesday day at the Valentine High School. Uh, the beauty of the night sky from up there is truly unbelievable. Uh, pictures obviously don't do it justice, but here are a few, and I'll try to give you some idea what it's like. Okay. 
I'll just run through some Milky Way shots. I see this thing is acting up. Um, that's a shot. I, okay, this one was mine. I, I can't uh, say I'm as good as some of the other presenters on here. This one uh, shows you uh, this little loom down in the lower right there is Valentine, 40 miles away, just a little tiny loom. And of course, if, if you're out and you've been in really dark skies and you've done astro imaging, uh, I'm sure you know what these greenish streaks are. They're, they're uh, 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 oxygen three, uh, you know, greenish streamers in the in the night sky, almost like natural nature's light pollution. There, when we're into orientation, there's Andromeda. Of course, there's the double cluster in Perseus. There's another shot of the beautiful lake. This is a a dear friend that also uh, comes up from Omaha. Uh, nice, you know, landscape shot there. I got a series that were taken a couple of years ago by a gentleman by the name of Matt Belsky he comes out from Chicago. He's a regular. Uh, he obviously you can tell he's very, very good at it. Uh, these are just some incredible views of, of what we uh, have to offer up there as far as the Milky Way. Beautiful. I mean, you can see clear night. You can see how dark it is. The, you can see stars, you know, right down to the horizon. And the, the, the foreground is, is what we call our daub row. It's a, a, an area paved off uh, with asphalt. I suppose about maybe a half or a third or half the size of a football field. Makes it very convenient to set up the big scopes, which I'll show you some pictures of it later there. There's an example of, uh, of uh, those of you who've never been out to a really major star party, uh, what you have to look through. Um, uh, you get some incredible views through these uh, giant uh, Dobsonian telescopes. And of course, it's all about looking at deep sky. There's a, a close up of, or a little bit closer to blue view, of Andromeda in 110 and 32. Now, we do get a lot of natural light pollution different times of the year up there. Um, of course, Aurora Borealis, but uh, makes for some colorful imaging. But we also have to contend with nature in other ways, too. Uh, fortunately, this particular cloud was way off to the east. So it wasn't going to be any problem for us that particular night. You know, we're in the, the westerly flows up there. So if you're looking at clouds building up the east, you're pretty confident they're not going to back up on you and give you any problems. However, <laughs> we do experience some weather. And this was one night... Uh, it was just really incredible. This is a shot again from this Matt Bilski. Um, believe it or not, all that stuff moved around to the west and south of us. That's looking northwest right there. You know, the sun was setting. You can see a, a lightning bolt over there. And, and so if you're into shooting awesome cloud pictures, there's another reason to come up to the star party. Yeah. Incredible. It is. Okay, here's... Another set, set up scene, uh, it becomes just one big party. I mean, you say star party, yeah, you're out there looking at the stars, but this event is a friendly, family-oriented, uh, this becomes a party. Yeah, people pitch their tents right on this, this Modoff area. It's all uh, uh, Nebraska Game and Parks, Manny's property. Uh, they're kind enough to come out with the big mowers and mow off all the grass. Uh, and the only thing you got to watch out for is the prickly pears. They're, they have these little prickly pears, so don't uh, don't bend down and, and kneel down on it uh, or make sure at least you uh, look before you do. They'll even stick to uh, the bottom of uh, like tennis shoes, rubber soles, but usually they don't go through. But just a little thing to be cautious I, I of. I never experienced this problem. Well, it, it, you, typically I don't. Yeah, but... But they, they're out there. Just got to be they careful. They are out there. Okay. Uh, but you can see that just uh, all sizes. Uh, we haven't seen this particular scope yeah, for a couple of years, a but they scope. come down from, I think it's a 36, come down from uh, Rochester, uh, Minnesota. You know, our bulk of the people that do show up, and we now in recent years, we, we're getting up to 375, 380. We haven't hit 400 uh, in recent times, but we have in the past. I think that was a mm -hmm. yeah 36 inch there. 
another shot of the, the, the asphalt area that we call Dobro, although it's more than just Dobsonians end up sending up. The, the gentleman here on the left, he, he made this all himself uh, with a, you know, his own uh, CNC machine, machining. You see the rocker very low to the ground. Wow. I think it was a 22 yeah. inch scope there. Beautiful. And of course, as night falls, you get some amazing silhouettes of the sky and the big scopes all set up to start viewing. But it isn't all just viewing. We also have a, a caterer that comes and, and it sets up and, and provides an absolutely delicious meal on Sundays, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursday nights. And uh, nobody goes away hungry from those meals. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of a lot of fun, just meeting, greeting, renewing acquaintances. As those of you that are regular attendees of star parties, that's that's probably half of it is just getting together and and, and reacquainting, meeting people you haven't seen for a while. Now, so John, there's yeah, uh, there's yeah. someone named uh, Astro Mo watching on YouTube, and. Uh, they say, if you do go to Nebraska Star Party, make sure you visit us at the campsite village uh, known as Dorlandian. Dorlandian. Now that, yeah, I, I didn't ask him. Dor Dorlandian's all I about. didn't ask him, and I, I don't know if I got that picture in, but uh, um, Astro Mo, I guess that must be uh, Michael Morderson. He, and this this is the gentleman that started. His name is, is Louis Dorlan. So that's where we okay. get Doryland from. And they've combined their tents. Uh, our, the Omaha Islamical Society president, uh, John Larson, usually shows up uh, here. And a friend, they usually bring an RV, but it, it just becomes one big camp area. And uh, so we, uh, we have discussions, uh, especially if it's a little cloudy, um, and, you know, libations flow. And we just have a wonderful time. But it was all this gentleman yeah. right here, uh, Louis Dorland, is where we got the name. And uh, there I happen to be my years truly there. <laughs> However, uh, and it, it can really get crazy uh, if it's really a night to not to observe. We get break out the musical instruments and uh, we party hardy, uh, singing songs, playing uh, uh, instruments. So. As I said, it's it's an all around party atmosphere up there, uh, and like I said very friendly, very very good time had by all you. Some okay, uh, just another little thing as that was announced in 2022, just shortly after the Star Party, uh, working with the International Dark Sky Association, which I forgot to change that is now called International Dark or, or uh, Dark Skies International. They just took the first three words and changed them around and uh, with a lot of help and collaboration from Nebraska Game and Parks and the Nebraska Tourism Commission, the big announcement that this area Merritt Reservoir is now a international dark sky park. And it was uh, the 200th dark sky park registered or, or de uh, designated in the world. So it has added a lot of uh, interest and excitement, not only for the star party, but for just you know, astro or destination tourism uh, for the area up there to go see truly, truly dark skies. Okay, specifics about this coming year. Uh, the dates this year are going to be July 28th through August 2nd. Uh, we've kept the registration fees the same, $60 per adult. Uh, if you register early, we up it to 75 after July 1st because it's always just kind of a scramble. Uh, to get everybody in then. And uh, with children, we emphasize um, bringing kids uh, if you're off in summer break. So we keep children's prices still at $15. Uh, as I said before, catered meals, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursdays. Uh, beginners field school, those Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And, and Wednesday, we go to the high school in town, which is, has a nice, beautiful air conditioned auditorium. It's always a nice uh, midweek break if it's been a hot week uh, to go in and listen to some talks and, and uh, enjoy. We have an astrophotography contest uh, 
imaging uh, and swap meets and just a, a good day to relax and enjoy Valentine's Day. This year, okay, I missed one there. See, I was scrambling, I didn't get them all. 31st year. Here's our t-shirt design this year. Uh, our cool. guy that makes this up, uh, he's quite, quite, quite an imagination. And um, so we were kicking around this whole idea, just imagine um, what it could be like. And he came up with this. Uh, it was put on our um, brochures. We were a little late getting uh, mailing out the brochures this year. Uh, they have been mailed out now. The website is now open for online registration. Uh, I'll show that here in a second. Uh, but this will be uh, emblazoned on the uh, commemorative T-shirt for this year. And uh, if you haven't caught it already, look at the bottom, what it says there. That's the complete address for Merritt Reservoir. <laughs> there you go. Merritt, Nebraska, USA, Earth, Sol System, Orion, Cygnus, Arm, Milky Way, <laughs> Galaxy. Ask for us nerd uh, types. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we've got a couple of great speakers uh, or lined up so far. We'll probably have one more we're still working with. Uh, a gentleman by the name of James Schweitzer. He's got his PhD in astrophysics, University of Chicago. Uh, he was interested in creation of the Center of Astrophysical Research in Antarctica, uh, which uh, he's been there, what, four, four or he, which found, he found with him twice at the South Pole. Um, we're not sure exactly what his topic is, but I understand he's an engaging speaker and, and will have uh, a, a very uh, informative talk. Another one, uh, um, Michael and Kendra Sibertson, uh, husband and wife team. They also run what's called Branched Oak Observatory, a nonprofit observatory down closer to uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, the capital of Lincoln. And their members of the Prairie Astronomy Club will discuss. Uh, uh, they, they, they are involved with what's called the National Eclipse Ballooning Project this year. So they'll be presenting their results um, from their hopefully successful uh, total solar eclipse ballooning project. Uh, okay, here's, as I said, that's the website, uh, nebraskastarparty.org. Uh, you can go there and you can download if you prefer mailing in a registration or uh, you can register online, uh, walking through all the, the various steps that uh, are needed to register. Uh, we also have a Facebook page if uh, you're interested in following us on space, Facebook. Uh, just of course slash Nebraska Star Party. As I said earlier, early registration will be open July 1st. Uh, so register early, take advantage of the discounted price. Um, and may, or you can mail it in, as I said. Okay, short and sweet, but any questions, comments? I guess I can uh, revert there are back. Comments. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Astromo says come for the star stay for the music yep if it's cloudy there's always live music um and that food tent reminds me of stellophane <laughs> so there you oh, go. okay and then there was the mention about dorlandia which is how did he get the name dorlandia well um, the, 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 uh that, that gentleman in that with the beard uh he's yeah. been a fixture just like me with the Omaha Astronomical Society for many years. Uh, he served as president one time, as did I. But then uh, he is a, a, a consummate camper. He brings up his yeah. minivan and pitches his tent right there and has been doing that for years. <laughs> um, and then uh, a couple of others, as I mentioned, is Mike Moterson and uh, John Larson. They've kind of thrown in with him and, and they set up a whole kind of tent city there uh and it's just uh mm -hmm. south of the area that i was describing and had pictures of of the the asphalt area which is it really makes it nice dobro, now you can right? dobro we just nicknamed it dobro because that's otherwise i mean there's you know people that will pull out in the on the general field if they can fly a flight enough spot to uh load a, or unload a big telescope because as most of you know the the Dobsonian type telescopes need a 
a flat surface uh, to sure. work correctly, uh, contrary to maybe somebody having a, you know, a tripod and everything. And we do we do have another area. We have a lot of property up there. Uh, this, those of you who've been there, and uh, we try to concentrate the observing area around this Dobro and that area. Uh, but uh, we are getting more and more astro imagers, very serious am am astro imagers that, and we've kind of designated a separate area on the property where they can set up and they can, you know, have whatever lighting they need to run their laptop computers and and, and equipment to. Uh, do their imaging so it um so we try to accommodate everybody um and and we're, as i said we're, we're not as strict with light pollution as a lot of places but uh, we do encourage you to follow the guidelines we put out in our uh, program guide and everything that to avoid uh, you know turning your headlights on of course most modern cars now you have no choice so typically what we do is we set up an area as far away as possible from the observing, actual observing field uh, where you can park your cars, especially if you have one of those that, you know, blazes light as soon as you unlock it or open the door. But, um, uh, but like I said, uh, and then, you know, if, if there's any kind of emergency or anybody has a, a medical issue, then all bets are off and we do whatever we're required to do to help sure. everybody. So. Sure. Well, anyway, it's a great place to go to. And, uh, very accommodating and some of the nicest people in the world are up there. So uh, thank you. Thanks very much, John. Thanks. And appreciate and, it. Uh, I know that there's people in our audience that want to go. So yeah, yeah. More the merrier. We, we have more room. I don't think we've ever, I mean, what a, a limit. The limit would probably be if just getting everybody fed in the evening meals. So, uh, but we, right. we manage that pretty well too. And uh, so. Yeah, I uh, I uh, have been doing it. I think I'm, as I said, I've made all but three of them in those 31 years. And plan on getting up there this summer. I also just another plug. I I plan on doing uh, eclipse chasing too, but I'm going down in your neck of the woods, Scott. I'm going to try to get down to around Russellville um, to okay. observe the eclipse. So so hopefully I can find a a back highway down there. Uh, I can yeah, get you down mentioned and... <laughs> that's your... Yeah. Uh, well, good luck to so, you. Yep. So good luck with everybody on the Eclipse. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Looking Thank forward you. to it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, that was nice to have uh, John on. He's been uh, running that star party for quite some time now. So did you ever go to a Nebraska star party, David? Did you lecture up there? I believe I did once. I'm not 100% sure. David, I'm thinking early, early on. I, there was the first few years, uh, I I just was not that involved, basically, because I I didn't have any vacation. I'd switch jobs and, and you know, working for a company, you may take you two or three years to build up enough uh, time. I thought we might have had you up there in one of those early years. Um, Oh, what was some of the? I know we had um, Brian Skip up once from Lowell. I, we might have had you up there. Yeah. Sounds like a place I'd love to go back to. You're always welcome. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again. Okay. So, David, our um, our uh, next to the final speaker is Marcello Souza down in Brazil. Uh, and uh, he is getting ready, I think he's getting ready for the 16th IMAA conference, which is, uh, had uh, astronauts and all kinds of really interesting uh, speakers down there. I don't, uh, David, did you go to Brazil to uh, oh, yeah. uh, speak at one of those conferences? That was, that was one of my most memorable conferences. Yeah. And there was a special thing there. While I was doing my lecture, on SL9, um, <clears throat> I was showing the slides with the music. Yeah. And the translator who was running the slideshow looked at me and he interrupted me and he said, I think you want to turn it around and look at the uh, auditorium. And I turned around and what the kids were doing was that they were shining their lights to the music and dancing oh. as, as, the, uh, as the music went on. And I don't think I've ever been so 
so moved by one of my own presentations, helped along by those kids with their flashlights. And uh, I ended up that in the ending, the last page of my autobiography, I mentioned that as one of the most important events of my life. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, uh, Marcello is also uh, the editor of uh, Skies Up magazine. Uh, Skies Up uh, was started uh, with uh, David and Wendy Levy. And uh, David, of course, puts in an article on every issue, as do I. And uh, Marcello, thank you very much for coming on to the 146th Global Star Party. So thank you very much. You <laughs> You got the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, yeah. Dr. David Levy, be sure that it was a very special moment for us also. Well, uh, for us, was everybody, don't forget these moments during the event. Yes. Thank you very much for coming. I hope soon you. you will be with us again. Yeah. I, I would love to go back. It is a fabulous place, and uh, uh, for everyone who has not been to Brazil, it's definitely a place you have to go to at least once. So, yeah. I, I will share my screen here. Uh, only a moment, because uh, sometimes this computer don't do what I want, but today I think that uh, everything will work fine. Can you see my... It oh, sorry. Like it's going to looks like it's going to start sharing here in a moment. Let's give it a couple of seconds. Can you see? Not yet. Oh Just no. A moment here. Maybe it's loaded. Oh, uh, maybe. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. There yes. We go. Uh, yes. This this last week we had the opportunity to organize an event for almost. 90 students that visited the Reserve Caruara. That's a very special place here. And uh, is my daughter was there also because she studies in this school. And uh, we had the opportunity to show the sun for these kids oh, and cool. talk about astronomy for them. It was, again, ever it is a very special moment here. And the opportunity to, to talk about astronomy for kids. And you can see you have a lot of kids that participate. These are all the teachers involved. We have four classes of students on the third grade. And the, now we're organizing events with students with frequency here preparing for the international meeting that we are organized in, in April. And this was an opportunity to show them, talk with them about astronomy. And I also had the opportunity to participate in a national conference about science and technology for social development. And uh, during this event, this, uh, with the Thai in the middle, he is responsible for the popularization for, of science in Brazil. Uh, he is a representative of the Ministry of Science for the popularization of science in Brazil. And I had the opportunity to talk, to make a, a short presentation about astronomy. Uh, very short, because each one of us had the opportunity to talk a little about uh, su uh, presenting suggestions for the uh, global uh, national plan about the popularization of astronomy and science here in Brazil. This uh, conference that I organized here, this was the first part of this conference uh, that uh, they organize in, in different Brazilian regions. And then in June, we are going to have a national uh, final meeting to write the plan for the next years here in Brazil for 
the plan for the popularization of science here. And this was a, a great opportunity for me to be involved. And now I will talk about tides, because I, I will show something that happened here in Brazil that is different from other places in the world, I, I think so. I think that this only happens here in Brazil. And uh, what we have here in schools, I think that uh, is the same in many places of the world, because when they talk about tides, generally they talk only about the gravitational influence from the moon and the sun. Uh, that they say that is responsible for the tides. And we know, we know that this is not uh, the uh, explanation for the tides. Uh, this explains part of uh, the, what, what happens, but uh, you have to consider also that the moon and the earth, the orbit around uh, the, the moon orbit around the earth, but the uh, center of gravity of the system earth and the moon is not in the center of the earth. Is located in, in the Earth, but not in the center of the Earth. Then, when the Moon is rotating around the the, the Earth, we are, the Moon, the Earth also rotates. And this, we we have the we as we are in a system that is rotating, we have for us we need to create a natural force. That you call you have the centric, centrifugal effect. Then this, uh, we, when we consider the centrifugal effect for us in Earth, and the influence of the gravitational field from the Moon and from the Sun, then we can explain what uh, the tides. Here we you know I, I show ever this for when I make presentation about tides here in Brazil, because uh, students generally uh, in their books have ever the moon, the sun, and the earth in the same direction. Then they, uh, I don't know why they don't ask, why you don't have eclipse every month? Because uh, they are in the same direction. Now we know that uh, uh, they, the moon, uh, has the orbit of the moon has uh, almost five degrees uh, of inclination uh, in, uh, uh, from the equator of, uh, from, sorry, from the eclipse. That is the plan that the orbit of uh, the Earth around the sun. And this is the correct image. And this is what I said. Right? Here in this dot, in the blue dot here, is the position where we have the, the axis, right? where is the center of gravity between the moon and the earth as a true system. Right? And then when the, here, I, I'm only showing the, in this image the moon, the earth, and the centric, the effects of this rotation of the earth when the, the moon is rotating around in his orbit. And here we see in the white is the effect of the gravitational field of the moon on the different parts of the earth. The blue is the effect of the centrifugal effect né? from the Earth rotating uh, when the Moon is rotating around the Earth. And this is in this direction. And here we have the results between the two forces. That is the green one. Then this explains we have uh, uh, tides in the two sides of the Earth. Uh, we have this side in the direction of the moon, and the other side, uh, the, here, the effects of the centrif centrifugal force is stronger than the effect, the gravitational field 
the effect of gravitational field uh, from of the moon. Then we have tides in two sides, and and to understand what's happening, we we need to consider also the influence of the gravitational uh, field of the sun and in the two sides of the earth and the difference between the gravitational field on one side and the other side of the earth the same what happens during from the moon and the uh, the tides are stronger when you have new moon and the full moon because the, the moon is in direction almost in direction of the sun then they sum the, the force, the influence of the sun and the moon. And here is when you have uh, the crescent, the first quarter and last quarter here. They are not so strong. The tides are not so strong because they are in different directions, the moon and the sun. And uh, here what happens in a normal place, uh, you have four tides during the day. Uh, generally, you have more of this because it's six hours and the 15 minutes, more or less, for each tide. Then we have uh, the low tides and high tides during the day. And it also depends on the latitude in the Earth, on the Earth, uh, mm -hmm. near the equator, are uh, stronger, and when you go in direction of the poles, they are not so intense. O only if you have a bay, because it, one of the highest tides in the world is happens in Canada, in a bay in Canada. Hmm. I saw also in here in Brazil, in Maranhão, a place when I arrived there is a is a bay, and when I arrived you have all the boats there. Six hours after, all the boats, you, you, you don't, I didn't see water because the boats, the boats were in, on the soil you know, with no water. But, and now you know that here in Portuguese, I don't know how to say the correct word in English, but for us in Portuguese, it's easier when you have the tides of the full moon and the new moon and the quadrature for the, the first quarter and last quarter. I don't know the correct thing. Uh, sorry, I don't know the correct word in it. But it is uh, something that I think that's important about the tides. What is the tide? Man? Why you have a high, you have the water, more water in a, in a direction, in a position, and the less water in other position? Uh, what happens is this that in this picture here, because uh, the gravitational fields, uh, the force, the gravitational force is in direction uh, to the moon. Then you have here a component of this force that is represented here by the white arrow that represents that the water moves in this direction. Then we have the water moving in this direction. Then we have the high tides. And here is the position where we have the low tides. There is a movement of the water in one direction, caused by the effects that I showed before, for the three reasons. That's the movement of the system Earth Moon and the gravitational difference of gravitational field of the Moon and the Sun in the different parts of the Earth. But here is what I like to show. Here is uh, the highest tide in the world is more than 330 meters. Uh, wow. That happens in, in a bay in Canada. That uh, is here. I don't know if you are uh, here. Show the tides here. <laughs> the water disappear. <laughs> <laughs> the same thing here. So I saw something like this 
here in the north region of Brazil. But here you have something that is fantastic, that you call Pororoca. That, that is an indigenous name for a effect caused by the okay. tides in the Amazon River and the rivers near Amazon. Here you see the Amazon River. Né? Mm -hmm. Here is a position where the, the region, where the river meets the Atlantic Ocean. And during the, uh, all the full moon and new moon, the water from the ocean enter in, in the direction of the river and move and you have an the current in a different direction, the influence of the these tides. But during the equinox, they are more intense. Then the water of the ocean moves more than 800 kilometers in the direction of the river, crossing the river. Then this movement, hmm. you, have, uh, you have waves big waves. These waves, uh, they surf in these waves, and these waves have the duration almost of one hour or more than one hour. Uh, then uh, you have the records, is a, uh, someone that surf one wave during almost 40 minutes. Is, some, is this what happens? You have a wave that Moves in oh, wow. info to the river. <laughs> that looks fun. And we have a lot of people that surf, doing surf in this For wave. We have waves <laughs> with four meters, four meters. Wow. And it and they goes inside the river and it moves almost 800 kilometers during the equinox. I hear a lot of Good. people surfing. I will show now, only for a short minute, a video. Uh, let okay. me see if if we work showing the this. Only a moment. Uh, let me see. Okay. Uh, I will share the screen. Now, okay. é something fantastic, Scott. I think that's here. Uh, I don't know if you can see. Can you see? Yes. All right, what happens? Oh, wow. Look at this. The perpetual wave. This is incredible. Yes. <laughs> Move almost 800 kilometers wow. inside the river. These are water from the ocean. Yeah, this is very cool. Someone stayed during almost 40 minutes in this, uh, in this wave. Man. Yeah, you can perfect your surfing technique this way, that's for sure. <laughs> These are paradise for the people that like surf. Well, yeah. When I was young, I used to surf. We yes. never had a wave like that. <laughs> and this is something that we happen we have here in Brazil, mm. and it is associated with the influence of the gravitational fields of the sun, the moon, and the movement of the system, uh, Earth and the moon. And now we are organizing, we are preparing to organize a, a festival of astrotourism before our events, because between uh, in April, uh, for April 2nd to 8th, it is the International Dark Sky Week. Né? That uh, is proposed by Dark Sky, né? and we coordinate here the Dark Sky in the state of Rio de Janeiro, here in Brazil. And we created here the Caminho das Estrelas, that is the pathway of the stars. Yeah. Something like this in English, I don't know. Uh, the road of the stars. Mm 
né? É, and we have also we visited more than 10 cities and we uh, organize here information about the best place in these cities to see the stars in a dark sky. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we have many places here that separate. And our international meeting. Yeah. That happened from April 25, 27. We are inviting everyone to come here to participate, to be very welcome here in Brazil. Here is the link. 150th for the 150th anniversary of... Uh... Of, yes, uh, 150 uh, years. Uh, yes, the, the, this person was responsible for the beginning of for developing astronomy here in our city in the beginnings of the 20th century. He published observations from our city here in the bulletin of the Astronomical Society of France. Hmm. Yeah. In 20th century. He was the last person in the world that saw by naked eye the Halley Comet. That's wow. announced that the register of the last observation was made for, he made from campus here. Now, and the, this is the Skies Up magazine, and now we are receiving articles for the next magazine, next edition of the magazine. Everyone that wants to send contributions will be very welcome. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you very much, Thank Dr. You. David Levy. Ever is a great pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It was wonderful. Okay. Um, well, we have uh, a special presentation uh, to follow up on. Um, last uh, Global Star Party, we had... Um, uh, part one of Einstein's life. Um, and uh, we will finish off uh, this star party with uh, part two. Uh, it's about a half hour presentation. Uh, but uh, this focuses on Einstein's uh, um, belief that uh, the world could be disarmed. And, uh, you know, he was uh, indeed a pacifist. Um, but, um, on any account, uh, you know, uh, his role with the, uh, played out you know, with the atomic bomb and atomic energy today is still, um, still something of controversy and, uh, but also uh, hopefully uh, the source of clean fuel for the, um, and power for the future. So uh, I will, Go straight away to the uh, to the video, and I hope you enjoy it. Just arrived in 1930, he called for full disarmament. He suggested that if two percent of the military refused to serve, disarmament would follow. Each visit was a platform for internationalism, socialism civil rights and disarmament. The public tolerated it all. A legend was growing around him. There was the story, he asked Chaplin, what does all this adulation mean? Chaplin replied, nothing. But Einstein had learned how to use his public images with effect. Behind the scenes, academic politics were at play. When he left in 1932, Caltech, Oxford in England, Princeton were all courting him with permanent appointments. Einstein was undecided. Events were soon to force the issue. The leaders of Europe had debated disarmament for three years, hoping to spend less on arms and relieve the depression. It was a last chance for the League of Nations. We believe that progressive disarmament will not only relieve the burdens now pressing so heavily upon the backs of our taxpayers, but progressive 
progressive disarmament will make you, will make us more secure in international peace. Einstein was outraged. This is not a comedy. It is the greatest tragedy of modern times, despite the cap and bells and buffoonery. We should be standing on rooftops denouncing this as a travesty. If you want peace, we shall ask the workers to refuse to manufacture and transport military weapons and to refuse to serve in the military. Governments could go on talking from now to doomsday. We must prevent the destruction of Western civilization. That summer in Berlin saw the last days of a culture that had bridged the 19th and 20th centuries. To those born before the Great War, there was the security of the things from out of their past. The atmosphere of gracious ideas, the civilized ways. It seemed comfort enough against the future. The Nazis were now the political force of Germany, controlling the streets and poles. That summer, Einstein finally agreed to spend part of each year at a new institute for research at Princeton. When he left for his visit that year, he knew that he was leaving his home forever. He called himself a bird of passage. Across the Atlantic, the Nazis came to power. Einstein's house in Kaput searched, confiscated. His colleagues in the Prussian Academy forced his resignation. The events demonstrated to Einstein the failure of international order. Now there was a conflict in his mind. Could a pacifist commit himself to a military struggle against fascism? At a 54th birthday dinner in New York, he had spoken English for the first time in public. Dear friend, I was so covered with flour that it's very difficult for me to bring to you my humble words. But I do it in German. The Bedeutung der Jerusalemer Universität für das jüdische Volk. Jerusalem University has particular meaning now. Jews in Europe are being extensively denied access to education and the professions. Over the years, I have read and heard much of this sorrow. It is not easy to say where the western boundaries of Europe are to be found. Einstein made one more trip to England that summer. He went into seclusion. The Nazis put a price on his head. In London, he made a last speech to Europeans before he left for Princeton. His personal despair for mankind was apparent. I am glad that you have me given the opportunity of expressing to you here my deep sense of gratitude as a man as a good European and as a Jew. I should like to give expression to an idea which occurred to me recently. Man, like every other animal, is passive by nature. Unless goaded by circumstance, he scarcely takes the trouble to reflect upon his condition and tends to behave as mechanically as an automaton. As a child and a young man, I pass through such a phase. One thought only of the trivialities of one's personal existence and strove to talk and act like one's fellow. There are forces at work which seek to destroy the European heritage of freedom, tolerance, and human dignity. Fascism, nationalism, militarism, and communism, while constituting diverse political institutions, all lead to the subjugation and enslavement of the individual by the state and put an end to tolerance and personal liberty. Individualism, 
recognized basis of European civilization is more seriously threatened by the military organization of countries than anything else. A war is not a parlor game to be played according to definite rules. In London, Einstein also had spoken about places, even in our modern society, where the creative mind could pursue pure thinking. The Institute for Advanced Studies became that place for the remainder of his life. Here he continued a lonely search for a unified field theory, one which would link the physics of particles with the physics of space. The hallmark of Newtonian particle theories was action at a distance. However, this did not suit Einstein because theories of action at a distance, he felt, could not describe the raw experience of daily life. Because occurrences in the world in which we live occur not by action at a distance, but by touch. And since in Einstein's view, science is a development of pre-scientific thought, then the best scientific theory is a field theory. However, neither special nor general relativity theory remove the disturbing dualism of particle and field. That is, both particles and fields existed side by side. So it was natural that Einstein's next step after the general relativity theory was to attempt formulating a unified field theory which could describe the electromagnetic and the gravitational field and that of which particles would emerge as knots in space-time. Later in his life, one of Einstein's colleagues asked him why he wasted his talents looking for a unified field theory. After all, by the late 1940s, it was known that there were more fields than just the gravitational field and the electromagnetic field. To which Einstein answered, well, it's good for somebody like me to look for a theory of that type because a younger man has to establish his reputation and cannot afford the time. And besides, perhaps we can learn something new from just this even restricted line of research. But he was still tied to the political realities of American science. Refugees from fascism, like Einstein himself, were pouring in. By 1940, 100 scientists. In isolationist America, Einstein spoke out for the oppressed of Europe. The effect upon all nations, and not least upon the Germans, of the fate of these innocent people, so mal maliciously persecuted, must not be underestimated. To leave these victims to their misery would be a heavy blow to all those who believe in human solidarity and would encourage those who believe only in force and oppression and who act accordingly. The refugee scientists could not easily find jobs. Funding had dried up in the Depression with the argument that science should be used for social engineering, not for proving relativity. Big physics and technology still attracted some money, such as the Palomar telescope. Scientists like Millikan lobbied hard, arguing that the natural sciences would pay off in the end. Frustrated, Millikan approached the army for help. Einstein, who was actively opposing Franco in Spain, was sympathetic. There was a common cause and argument the defeat of the Nazis. The New York World's Fair of 1939 was a showcase for the promise of science and technology. Although the government had not yet seen the light, the public was fascinated with the world of the future, the possibility of atomic power. Einstein was there to dedicate the Jewish pavilion, appealing again for aid for refugees. A war was beginning in Europe. A drama of equal magnitude was taking place in a laboratory in Berlin. Hahn and Strassmann in Berlin had discovered that the splitting of the atom released a tremendous energy. An atomic bomb might be possible. Their findings were rushed into print in early 1939. What happened then is one of the first legends of the atomic age, here reenacted after the war by the scientists themselves. The news was rushed to a physics conference in Washington. Leo Siard, another refugee, brought the information personally to Einstein, along with a draft letter to the president. They told Roosevelt that an atomic bomb was feasible for both the United States and Hitler. Links should be built between the government and American physics, they wrote. The government should fund a research effort. 
This was Einstein's last direct contact with the Manhattan Project, the building of the bomb. The irony was bitter for Einstein, the pacifist. 6,000 was invested by the government initially. By 1945, nearly two billion. The effort involved the physics community as a whole, including the elite theorists who had come to America as refugees. During the war, he worked with the Navy on explosives. He was approached about a problem relevant to the bomb. But when he sought more information, the files indicate that his history prevented him being given every confidence, a security risk. A new and powerful relationship between science and government was emerging. The development of science and creative activities requires freedom independence of thought from the restrictions of authoritarian and social prejudices. Theoretically, there is no authority whose decisions and statements can claim to be the truth. Is that time forever past when, aroused by his inner freedom and the independence of his thinking and his work, the scientist had the opportunity of enlightening and enriching the lives of his fellow human beings? Has he not forgotten about his responsibility and dignity as a scientist? As the possibility of the bomb became a reality in early 1945, scientists at Los Alamos and Oak Ridge began to express doubts about its uses. In June, the Franck report warned that if the bomb were used on Japan, international control afterwards would be impossible. An arms race inevitably would follow. But the bomb was dropped. National interests prevailed. The atomic bomb is too dangerous to be loose in a lawless world. That is why Great Britain, Canada, and the United States, who have the secret of its production, do not intend to reveal the secret until means have been found to control the bomb so as to protect ourselves and the rest of the world from the danger of total destruction. I shall ask Congress to cooperate to the end that its production and use be controlled and that its power be made an overwhelming influence toward world peace. Many scientists saw world peace as springing from a free exchange of information, the old ideal of international science. They began a program of public education and political lobbying. The proposed atomic legislation would have put nuclear development in the hands of the military under rigid security. The War Department will always have a vital interest in the use of atomic energy for military purposes. Despite the efforts of the military, represented by General Groves, head of the Manhattan Project, the scientists helped defeat the bill. A compromise, the McMahon Bill, created a Civilian Atomic Energy Commission, composed of government, the scientists, and the military. A new group was formed, the Emergency Committee of Atomic Scientists, with Einstein as chairman. Once again, they appealed for direct international control of atomic power and launched a program of public education. Einstein was more militant than others. In the winter of 1945, he had outlined what was to be his position over the coming years, world government and supranational authority over the military. He argued for freedom of scientific research, and in the Atlantic Monthly article, remained skeptical of the potential of atomic energy. To give any estimate of when atomic energy can be applied to constructive purposes is impossible. What now is known is only how to use a fairly large quantity of uranium. The use of quantities sufficiently small to operate, say, in a car or an airplane, is as yet impossible. So, Though the release of atomic energy can be, and no doubt will be, a great boon to mankind, that may not be for some time. An American plan was proposed for international control of materials, but the United States to retain vital information on atomic bombs. And Einstein's committee rejected it, and as the Russians were considering the plan, the first post-war test at Bikini took place. Now the Soviets vetoed the plan. Cold War politics had taken over. The crusade of the scientists had failed. 
In Washington, there was increasing concern for secrecy. America clashed with the Soviet Union over Eastern Europe. There was espionage, rumors of espionage. The House on American Activities Committee investigated American loyalties. The Truman Loyalty Oath was created for civil servants, scientists on government work included. And now so much research was for the government. Scientists were seen as weak links in atomic secrets. Over 150,000 were investigated. Now Einstein saw another imperative, academic freedom. With universal order should come universal freedom. On this, confidence and loyalty would flourish. But the existence of the bomb created dangers in the hearts of men, he said. He made one of his rare public appearances at the 1947 Princeton commencement. Truman was the guest speaker. Universal training represents the most democratic, the most economical, and the most effective method of maintaining the military strength we need. It is the only way that such strength can be achieved without imposing a ruinous burden on our economy through the maintenance of a large standing armed force. We must remember above all that these young men would be training in order not to win a war, but in order to prevent one. The Cold War escalated. Soviet and American challenge and response. Einstein wrote, political rhetoric is taking on a life of its own. The Emergency Committee of Atomic Scientists, linked to one world movements, lost credibility in the public eye. Magic of the atomic scientist was tarnished. For some elite scientists, such as Niels Bohr, international ideals were preserved through UNESCO with its programs for international development of atomic power. Science flourished, but the context had changed. Before the war, government funding of basic research was obtained only with difficulty, a few million dollars. Now, the linked government and military interests provided a billion dollars for research and development. It was the payoff sought in the 1930s. There was a certain inevitability in this. In the fall of 1949, the public learned that there were other bombs in the world. In January 1950, the announcement was made that America would develop a super bomb, the H-bomb. Einstein had been ill, a heart problem dating from 1928. He had continued his work toward a unified field theory alone but he had not lived as a recluse at Princeton. Since 1945, he had worked actively for his ideals. Now Einstein was offered a new medium to speak to the public. A televised response to the H-bomb decision had been organized by Eleanor Roosevelt. At 70, he spoke with the same idealism as in his youth. The armament race between the USA and USSR originally supposed to be a preventive measure assumes hysterical character. On both sides, the means to mass destruction are perfected with feverish haste behind the respective walls of secrecy. The hydrogen bomb appears on the public horizon as a probably attainable goal. Its accelerated development has been solemned. If successful, radioactive poisoning of the atmosphere and hence annihil annihilation of any life on Earth has been brought within the range of technical possibilities. The ghost-like character of this development lies in its, in its apparently compulsory trend. Every step appears as the unavoidable consequence of the preceding one. In the end, there beacons more and more clearly general annihilation. Is there any way out of this impasse created by man himself? All of us, and particularly those who are responsible for the attitude of the U.S. and the U.S.S.R., should realize that 
that we may have vanquished an external enemy, but have been incapable of getting rid of the mentality created by war. It is to achieve peace as long as every single action is taken with a possible future conflict in view. The leading point of view of all political action should therefore be what can we do to bring about a peaceful coexistence and even a loyal cooperation of the nations. The first problem is to do away with mutual fear and distress. Sullen renunciation of violence, not only with respect to means of mass destruction, is undoubtedly necessary. In the last analysis, every kind of peaceful cooperation among men is primarily based on mutual trust, and only secondly on institutions like courts of justice and police. This holds for nations as well as for individuals, and the basis of trust is loyal give and take. Einstein brought his ideals to America. He took only what he needed out of the American dream. A simple house on Mercer Street was never a barrier to the outside world. Over the years, the public somehow accepted two Einsteins. One was the advocate of unpopular causes. The other, here offered the presidency of Israel, the most famous living scientist. In 1954, an amateur astronomer, Zvi Gazari, visited Einstein. His nine-year-old son made these home movies. Einstein told him this story. When I was young, I wanted a telescope, but I've never been able to buy one because then it would become commercialized. So Gazzari built one for him. Einstein admired Gazzari because he could not himself build one with his own hands. Yet on his work was built theories of the universe. All right, well, can we all stand all right. up then? One of his last public appearances was to dedicate the Albert Einstein Medical College in New York. I am grateful that Yeshiva University has honored me by using my name in connection with the new College of Medicine. There is a shortage of physicians in this country and there are many young people able and eager to study medicine who under present circumstances are deprived of the opportunity to do so. Shortly before, his old friend from the Bern days, Besso, had died. Einstein wrote, This death signifies nothing. For us believing physicists, the distinction between past, present, and future is only an illusion, even if a stubborn one. Way, please, that's it. And over here, Doctor, if you please. Thank you.
I hope all of you enjoyed that. Um, I know I did, and uh, I certainly uh, did. Yeah, it's it's going to be something to I think uh, watch once again here. So, but uh, David, thank you for a fabulous uh, theme to uh, Global Star Party, and uh, we will reconvene next Tuesday uh, for the 147th Global Star Party as we get closer and closer to. Uh, to the 150th, we'll have to make it something really special. Uh, young Nicolina uh, 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 will be appearing on the next uh, Global Star Party as well. So uh, she just announced in chat that she's got 55 detections of asteroids under her belt right now. So, um, so I think that that's fabulous and. Uh, uh, we will have her on. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, uh, yesterday, you know, I, I, I was looking for a, uh, a good video of, uh, of astronaut Stafford, who was on uh, Gemini 6 and uh, Apollo 10, and um, was one of the first uh, astronauts to um, uh, get close to the moon. And um, you know, so, so I think that uh, at age 93, he lived a good long life and, and uh, you know, he had a, a, a bunch of uh, great adventures in exploration. So is there anything that you'd like to close with, David? Just to say that I'm really looking forward to next week. I am looking forward to seeing you in person at the eclipse. Yep. And uh, likewise, and we'll see you next week. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to all of our audience for watching and tuning in. So you guys have a, uh, a great night and keep looking up. How do these features in the solar corona, this atmosphere of the sun, how do those change? Sometimes they escape from the sun, sometimes they go back towards the sun, and that region is hard to um, really study, and we're going to get this little glimpse from Earth. My name is Laura Petacolis, and I am the principal investigator for the Eclipse Mega Movie 2024 project. So what's really unique about the eclipse, especially one like the one coming up, is that it's covering a very large path on land. And that means a lot of observers can be viewing it over an extended period of time. In this case, we are able to take images along that entire path in ways that you can't just do from one location on Earth or one location in space. And that gives us this really unique data set. In 2017, we made a movie of all the images. This time, we know how to make the movie more dynamic, and we're going to have more exposures, meaning that we'll be able to see more of the features in the solar corona than we were before. And although it's maybe not what one might think in terms of a movie, in terms of people and a plot, but for us solar physicists, it is very exciting to see even the smallest changes in the corona at the time scale we're going to get.
Did you know that you can participate in solar eclipse science with NASA? NASA's citizen science projects are collaborations between scientists and members of the public, no matter your citizenship. The general public is best suited for these kinds of projects because they will be on the ground over the whole path and that really can be kind of a force multiplier for how many observations you can take. Several volunteer science projects are gearing up for the 2024 total solar eclipse that you can join. There are many mysteries that come about during a total solar eclipse, ranging from the part of the sun that we can very rarely see, the corona and the birth of the solar wind really close to the surface of the sun, as well as the effects on Earth. Using telescopes and cameras that are safe for viewing the sun, volunteer scientists across North America will capture images of the total solar eclipse. Scientists will study these images in detail, tracking how plumes of solar material move through the sun's atmosphere. But be careful, without proper tools and techniques, you can damage your eyes and your camera. Amateur or ham radio operators will send radio messages to one another during the eclipse to see how changes in the upper atmosphere distort radio signals. The opportunity to conduct research and participate in citizen science during the upcoming total solar eclipse is really special. The sun is always changing, so we don't know what it's going to be doing right at that time. As the moon blocks one portion of the sun, it can make other portions easier to see. Working with local scientists at an observatory in Southern California, participants will observe magnetic hotspots on the sun as the moon passes over them, revealing details they normally can't detect. We have a public who's interested in different aspects of heliophysics and can actually contribute to our science. And so we really invite people to participate and we need all hands on deck for that. Follow Do NASA Science on X and Facebook to see how you can get involved in NASA citizen science. Thank you. 